sound check one two three yes we hear you thank you
Sana can you give me? Sanya, can you hear me? Can hear you loud and clear, Mario. Thank you. Recording in progress. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. Recording stopped. Recording in progress. The house champ has Let's see Lituba Lukanda Zangi C two no Mogzila. Uh, sorry. There are that were brought by time aware of No, there are certain simple pictures. Yeah, those preemptions. I need them all. Okay. Uh, honorable members. The first item on the order paper is a motion in the name of the Honorable N. Singh. I recognize you, Honorable Singh. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members and colleagues, Honorable Members of the Butulezi family, I hereby, on behalf of the Encarta Freedom Party, move that the House notes the passing of His Royal Highness Prince Mangasutu Butelezi, the traditional Prime Minister to the Zulu monarch and nation, the Inkosi of the Butelezi clan, and the founder of the Encarta Freedom Party on 9 September 2023. Further notes that Prince Butelezi was a member of Parliament from 1994 until his passing, recalls that he was a Minister of Home Affairs from 1994 to 2004, and that within this period, he was appointed acting president of the Republic of South Africa 
on 22 occasions. Further recalls that Prince Putalezi, mentored by the ANC's founder, Dr. Pixley Kaisaka Sema, and in Corsi Albert Lutuli, accepted the mandate of Mr. Oliver Tambo and in Corsi Lutuli to lead the erstwhile KwaZulu in order to undermine the apartheid system from within, recognizes the legacy of Prince Butelezi's unmatched leadership in KwaZulu Natal, expressed in physical infrastructure, economic strength, and social cohesion, acknowledges the leadership which Prince Butelezi gave to this house, where his voice of reason often restored order in this house, celebrates Prince Butelezi's immeasurable contribution to freedom, democracy, constitutionalism, education, conservation, peace, justice, equality, and nation building. Honors Prince Butelezi for his lifetime service to South Africa as a champion of our liberation struggle and a respected statesman in our democratic era. And finally, extends its condolences to His Majesty King Mrs. Zulu Gazwelatini, Renawasil, Prince Butelezi's children, the extended Butelezi family, and to the family of his late wife, Princess Irene Tandagila, who was his anchor for 66 years. Honorable Chairperson, I so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Singh. Honorable members, as I welcome the family of uh, Utaja Butelezi and the extended family, I will now call on the Honorable, the leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, House Chair. The Mashlabatini Plain is a wide and sweeping grassland in northern KwaZulu-Natal. It is rolling and magnificent in its ruggedness, populated by historic places and towns like Ulundi and Nongom. The hills, soils, and rivers of this plain have for centuries borne silent witness to the monumental bloody battles, the rise and fall of empires, and the very struggle for survival of the Zulu nation. The mighty plain is also where the life story of Prince Mangasutu Butlezi began and where, laid to rest at his beloved Pindangan, it ended. Where does one even begin to deal with such a long life? How does one choose which elements of a life so full and rich he lived to focus on? So perhaps it's best to start in the beginning. Born on the 27th of August, 1928, as a Zulu prince into a distinguished royal bloodline, Shenge attended university at Fort Hare, where his political activism and awakening began. He was ultimately expelled from the university for participating in a political student protest against the then governor general. In 1953, Shenge became the Nkosi of the Butelezi clan, and a year later was installed by King Cyprian as a traditional prime minister to the Zulu nation, a role he continued to discharge for 69 years until his passing this year. Prince Butelezi served as chief minister of KwaZulu-Natal, where he oversaw the building of hospitals and schools and other infrastructure, and also secured the funding for the Mangasutu Technicon, which operates to this day and which has been responsible for providing education to thousands of young South Africans. But the largest contribution that he has made to politics, the country, and to this house was the establishment in 1975 of what would ultimately become known as the Encarta Freedom Party. It was to this cause that he dedicated his life, turning the IFP into a formidable political force in KwaZulu-Natal and a national player in the political arena. It was as the leader of the IFP that Schenge first took his seat in this house in 1994 and was soon appointed as the Minister of Home Affairs, where he served in the governments of both President Mandela and President Mbeki. His television appearances, missives to the newspapers, formidable debating skills, and his keen love for history, particularly of his beloved Zulu nation, marked him out. His ability to recall in intricate detail the dynamics of famous battles fought by his ancestors against the British and the Boers 
made him a fascinating companion in any forum. When the book closes on a person's life, it is always tempting to cherry pick a certain chapter or a paragraph and then try to use that as a basis to judge their full contribution. We have seen in the weeks following Schenge's death attempts by critics and former opponents to do precisely that. I've always believed that the longer view is required, particularly when it comes to life as well lived and as fully lived as that of Prince Portelezi. The Democratic Alliance and our predecessors are proud of our long association with Prince Portelezi, and he enjoyed enduring friendships with many people from Ray Swart and Harry Schwartz to Helen Sussman, Colin Eglin, and Tony Leon. He was a man of impeccable manners and great compassion, a man who could sit with royalty, prime ministers, and presidents, but retained a humbleness about the common man whose plight he felt so deeply. He was also a man of deep faith who drew deeply on his Anglican faith and the trials, tribulations, and tragedies that characterized his private and professional life. It was also a great source of comfort when he lost his beloved Princess Irene. In later years, he became to fill the role of an elder statesman. And even when his health would fail him, he would still participate well into his sixth term as a member of this house. Today, we say thank you for the life of Prince Mangasutu Butlesi. And on behalf of the Democratic Alliance, we extend our condolences to his family and friends. We pray for comfort and healing, and we thank you for sharing him with the nation. To his beloved IFP, we extend our sympathies in the passing of your president, emeritus, and leader. And to members of the IFP, we hope that you will carry his memory as a lodestar into the future. Bulawayo, may you continue to draw wisdom from his many lessons and inspirations. I've no doubt today that those windswept grasslands of the Mashlabatini Plains whisper his Izitakazelo, Schenge, in tribute to its great son of its soil. I conclude fittingly with the words uttered by Horatio in Shakespeare's Hamlet, a favorite of the prince, and I quote, now cracks a noble heart, good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. We look forward to working with the IFP to find an appropriate way to honor the prince in his home province of KwaZulu-Natal. Thank you. Thank you. The Honorable Dr. Ndozi, yeah, there is a chair here for you. I know. It's fine. Go Thank forward. you very much, uh, House Chairperson. We take this opportunity to join in the condolence motion on the passing of the Prince of Pindangene, the Honorable Prince Mangusutu Teles. We convey our heartfelt condolences to the family, the IFP, the Zulu people, and South Africa as a whole. Indeed, the prince sat in these chambers from 94 when the first democratic parliament was constituted and served the people of this country, even as a cabinet member under President Mandela. He operated majority of his life under the difficult years of apartheid. We consider him to have formed part of an important generation of black leaders who were confronted by a very difficult hour in the history of black emancipation playing a crucial role in peace and political stability alongside Mandela, Mbeki, and Zuma. We must underscore this because IFP and ANC in those days unleashed unspeakable forms of violence against each other, contesting on the direction of our country. Over 30,000 people died on both sides. Ideologically, the differences are on record. Even we in the red overalls have had our own disagreements together with the prince as well as his party. However, we refuse to talk about this history as if it had, we have not had 30 years of hindsight, which allows us to reevaluate the true nature of our liberation. We refuse to be victims of ANC propaganda and dominant historic narrative. We must ask ourselves a simple question. How is it that many black political parties had violent confrontations with the NC before the collapse of apartheid, particularly in the 80s? Who can forget the killings and brutality that characterized confrontations of Azabo and UDF supporters in Soweto? Violence that often eh, involved gangsters. Who can forget the violence involving torture of homes, rape? The same occurred in Zamdela. In Sharpville in the 1990s, the biggest horrors 
of political violence were of self-defense units belonging to the NC that terrorized communities and each other, including gang rapes, kidnapping, necklacing. Therefore, you can disagree all you do, politically and ideologically, with the great prince or the IFP. But violence in the 80s and the 90s also largely included NC, whose hegemony was often enforced with brutal violence. Seemingly, apartheid created conditions where all disagreements could only be resolved with violence, particularly amongst black people. It is on these grounds that we must accept that the prince, Mandela, Zuma, and, Butel and, and Mbeki, as leaders, had to turn a painful leaf together and end enemy tensions, intolerance that threatened to collapse the black collective political subject of emancipation. They had to build peace because you cannot make peace with friends. Peace is made amongst enemies. We do this because we recognize the pain of all our people, from Wipadong to the Midlands, Eteguini to the north of the rivers of Utugel, who continue to who continue to live with terrible scars of those dark days. The violence intolerance was ended because of the efforts of the great prince of Pindangen. And this is his most important legacy. Today, we can tell of a history of the IFP that won KZN, lost it later to the ANC without the violence that characterized the 1990s. NC is losing municipalities now to the IFP. You don't see that violence that characterized the 1990s. This is what we mean by building peace. And this is the legacy of Prince of Pintangen. But let us conclude with a basic ideological observation. The Prince was a liberal, center-right political uh, led a center-right liberal political party which pursues honestly its policies and never lies about them. And this is important ethic in politics. His opponents on the other side of the house are the true hypocrites, promising to be custodians of the Freedom Charter, which speaks about nationalization, but have pursued for 30 years privatization, particularly of state-owned entities. On this score, the prince is a better human being because he never lied about what he believed in. We must ensure that when the NC loses power next year, it also accepts in political tolerance. So he was a great Christian, a great democrat, and may his soul rest in permanent peace and the peace that he built in this country together with Nelson Mandela. Thank you. I don't usually stop people on uh, this, but you went too far. Uh, honorable members, we now call on Ubabu Shabisa. Uh, honorable chairperson and honorable colleagues, it is, it is fitting that my maiden speech in this august house is to pay tribute to His Excellency Prince Mangosutu Ptelezi, my late mentor and leader, and one of the greatest statesmen of our democratic South Africa having made a profound contribution to our liberation struggle, Prince Telezi entered our first democratic parliament on 9 May, 1994. The IFP had won more than 2 million votes, securing seats in cabinet in the government of national unity. President Mandela appointed Prince Telezi as a minister of home affairs tasking him with the full transformation of immigration law and policy, opening our once parial state to investment, skills, tourism, and growth. A department which had served only a small minority was now to administer the documentation for millions of South Africa from Craig to Gray. He will oversee elections, government printing works, the films and publication board, and much more. And Principal Telezi excelled. He took the ball and ran with it, giving to South Africa laws and policy that had the potential to build both our economy and social cohesion. In 1999, when President Mbegi's offer of the deputy presidency 
was scoopered by the ANC in Wazulu Natal, Prince Telezi's service as Minister of Home Affairs was renewed for another five years. Throughout his time as minister, Prince Telezi served as acting president of the Republic 22 times. He was, in fact, our first acting president appointed by President Mandela as a sign of respect to Prince Telezi. That respect was echoed by everyone in this house over the course of almost 30 years. Reluctantly or willingly, everyone who served with Prince Telezi recognized his leadership, integrity, and wisdom. He became the voice of reason in this house so often. He rose to restore decorum when the dignity of parliament was undermined by unbefitting behavior. He will be remembered for his analysis of the state of nation, telling the people of South Africa what they wanted to hear. We extend our condolences to his family, to the IFP, and to the nation. Shane. Shane. So, Alisa. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable Khrunevans. I've said many times from this podium that what we need in South Africa is respect. Respect for yourself, respect for other people, respect for our differences, respect for our different cultures, respect for South Africa. And the Honorable Butelezi was a symbol of that. Respect. And all those features I've mentioned. I was in the house, it's about 10 years ago, where a member of the IFP stood up and made negative and derogative remarks towards the then leader of the opposition, official opposition, about her hairstyle. It was the Honorable but the ladies who stood up in Parliament, who apologized for his member on behalf of the freedom from to the member. Now, that takes leadership to stand up and to repudiate your member. Yes, I know people have different views on his views, but that was also a strong feature of the late Dr. Butelezi, that if he believed in his principles, he stick to those principles. Yes, there was many criticism against him, but he decided, like we say in Afrikaans, ye hokus. And that was the character of the Honorable Butelezi. As a devoted Christian, his actions were also always in the light of his belief. And therefore, the Freedom Front Plus want to say that he was a real example and a symbol of enhancing the decorum of this house. He was a person who contributed in a positive way also in terms of the future of South Africa. On behalf of the Freedom Front Plus, I want to say to the IFP, his family, his loved ones, may his re soul rest in peace with his heavenly father, and surely he is at the moment at a much better place as he was here on earth. I thank you. Thank you. The Honorable Muruti Mishwe. Please mute. Proceed, Honorable Mishra. Thank you, Speaker. It is with great respect, admiration, and affection 
that the ACDP extends its condolences mm -hmm. to His Majesty King Misizulu Kwa Zwelitini, Prince Butelezi's children, the extended Butelezi family and members of the IFP on the passing of an exceptional leader, Prince Mangozutu Butelezi, who was a member of this house from 1994 until his passing. This extraordinary man's immeasurable contribution to freedom, constitutionalism, peace, justice, equality, and democracy, nation building included, has been acknowledged both locally and internationally. The ACDP will always remember the leadership which Prince Butelezi gave to this house and his voice of reason that often restored order in this house. The ACDP joins this house in honoring Prince Butelezi for his lifetime of service to South Africa as a champion of a liberation struggle and a respected statesman in our democratic era. His firstborn child of seven children, Princess Humzile, says hers was a good father and an exceptional leader. Speaking of her father's love, she said he shared his wisdom with them on life and marriage and that he sent all his children to good schools and that despite being extremely busy, he always remembered to send boxes of groceries to their schools to ensure they had nutritious food. As I conclude, my prayer is that the great shepherd and savior of our souls, Jesus Christ, will heal all broken hearts and that the precious Holy Spirit will comfort all our souls, particularly that of the Butelezi family. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, ICT, I don't think anybody's allowed on the platform without a name. And we are always disturbed by people that use alphabets. Please mute them even before, because maybe it's your staff or somebody. We can't be disturbed all the time by Z. We don't know who Z is. Uh, Thank you, Betty. Thank you ever so much, uh, Sifuna Ukala City, the Gameni, the United Democratic Movement, and the Segalayo Ukui Kogela. Sifuna Ukutulisa, Umyalezo of Eloano. We IFP, we family, Nabo Bakfuchane, we African, I beg your pardon, we got a freedom party, I beg your pardon. On the passing of Pring Mangusutu Buteles. We are the good language to understand that Klagu Bube in Daga in Gula Maganda abroad. Since Oklando Vageti na band Bashegen Gemva ba fund leyo ku Prince Mangu soto buteles nga kumbi glendlu. Uba galoke benga keti buuso. Ebe sete klagu teti nyani so ame afume anga fumi. Ebe nga fumukji kangenga ni kubadi na ninga mtando ga ninga fumelani na. Ku Prince Mango Sutu Butelezi ube koe mzanzi Afrika nge klaisha le, le mbali enzima. Apo siya kona kuinkulu lego ilizwe. Indo bebe kheli ndao ni aiso ngagi itu yeyake. Okubalu legle ndo bakufunegi galelo lake kui, kui, kui demokrasi yo mzanzi Afrika na kuifumana siya knowledge. Okwe sibi ni mnandi bene nyue mba yoki sebenza no Prince Mago Sutu Butelezi. Ndingu Secretary we Forum of Opposition Parties, bendi back career at the time. Eh, bendi langoba mesmerized by the man's intelligence, his photographic memory. He could be able to remember and recall in significant detail. The last time you had a meeting, what were the discussions, what time the meeting started, and what time the minic, minic meeting finished, and what way for way forwards did you actually decide upon? And and through that you'd be able to guide discussions in our meetings. Tina Sifanle is a sifunde Quingo Kelez Fananotata Uteles. Sia Zukuti as in Dwezin Tabaz and Zelum Zanz Africa Zizi Tina Funia Sikubegana. So this girl band is Ukumsha Kubandi Funuguta Bandu Bapa Gwanongo Mabandi Ve Tinga Bining Miligit in Tetis Gi Zababa Pelibe Pitega Bengandi. Magala lengo kolo menze tiko apum lengo na pagate um kanyi se lengo kanyi so olga gmi diabule. Chogo zem tonisha. Eh, mamma kau. 
Uh, thank you very much, House Chairperson. Greetings to the Butelese family at large. ATM conveys a heartfelt condolences to the late Prince Mangosutu Butelese of Kwapindangene, Ushange Usondia. Family to the IFP, people of KZN, and to the people of South Africa. A wonderful leader, not only in politics, but in defending and protecting the culture of the Zulu nation at large. A prime minister of KwaZulu government, where he delivered a lot of service to the people of Natal and KwaZulu. Among those, we can mention a number of agricultural, agricultural colleges like Owens Tolle and others. He has been prominent in establishing financial institutions like Itala Bank, was Zulu development finance that aimed at developing the people of KZN. He was a unifier, a peacemaker, a man of a strong character who could not hide his feelings in anything. We lost a hero, a true leader, a voice of reason in this house. On behalf of African Transformation Movement, we are saying may his soul rest in peace. Thank you very much, House Chair. Thank you, Ma. May I now recognize the Honorable Sheikh Imam? Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Allow me to acknowledge the presence of the Butelezi family. The Honorable late Prince Mangosutu Butelezi was born into the Zulu royal family as the son of Princess Mahoko Kardinu Zulu. King Mahogo. Magogo, is it? Thank you very much. <laughs> royal family is the son of Princess Magogo. He joined the African National Congress Youth League at the University of Forte and completed his studies at the University of Natal. On the advice of Nkosi Albert Lutuli, he responded to the call of the Butelezi clan and returned to Mslabatini. Have I got that one right? <laughs> Thank you. In 1953, to take up his duty position as Nkosi. To reignite the struggle for liberation, Within South Africa, following the banning of the African National Congress and other parties, Prince Mutalezi founded the Inkata Freedom Party. And Inkata Freedom Party quickly grew into a formidable liberation organization. Now, um, he served in his capacity under President Nelson Mandela and often served as the acting president as well. The National Freedom Party is very grateful to our late Honorable Butelezi because he identified uh, our former leader, Zanele Kamamogwaza Msibi, and gave her a platform to be who she was until her untimely death. On behalf of the National Freedom Party, we want to thank the late Honorable Butelezi and the Inkata Freedom Party. We want to extend our condolences to the family, friends, the party as large. But finally, we want to send one message to you. Prince Mangosutu Butelezi has always had one in thing in mind and that he wanted to unite the IFP and the ANC. And I want to urge you to continue in that direction to, for the legacy of the former leader, Prince Mangosutu Butelezi. I thank you. Thank you. Honorable Jafta. Thank you, Honorable Sir. Honorable sir, order, I, I must order members. I must apologize. We are traveling on how to doing public hearings. My background may not be that much great. No problem. Proceed, Tonish. Honorable sir, we must re record from the onset that the legacy of Prince Butelius is multi layered. Prince Butelius transitioned in September this year at the age of 95. The prince was the traditional prime minister of the Zulu monarch. From 1968 to 2000 to 2023, he also became chief minister of Kwazulu from 1972 to 1976. He is known for refusing nominal independence for Kwazulu from the apartheid government, resisting the resisting efforts to turn the then Kwazulu into a Bandu stand. Prince Butelezi was also highly educated. He attended Adams College from 1944 to 1947. He also obtained a PA degree at the University of Natal and was conferred honorary doctorates by the following universities. University of Boston in USA, uh, the University of Forte, the University of Zululand, and the University of Cape Town. Prince Butelezi's legacy 
that of a patriot and a, a builder. To this end, we know that the prince built, built the University of Zululand, opening up the frontiers of academic, academic, academic learning to many impoverished families. We know from history that Prince advocated for the recognition of traditional leadership, which is today entrenched in the Constitution. We hail him for his unwavering commitment to the institution of traditional leadership. We cannot thank the Prince enough for his role in enabling the 1994 democratic elections to take place. We applaud him for remaining true to his oath of office as a member of parliament. He respected the supremacy of the constitution, the rule of law, and the independence of our the independence yeah. of our the for the independence. He respected the supremacy of the constitution, the rule of law, and the independence of our God. May his spirit of may the spirit of Prince be spared. May it rest in eternal peace. We wish to pass our condolences to the prince family of to the family of the prince and his loved one, including his uh, party, the IFE. The IFP. I thank you, Honorable Sir. Thank you. You may mute, Honorable Jafta. I'm trying to do this. Mute, Honorable Jafta. IT mute, assist him with the muting. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. The Congress of the People expresses its, its, its sincere condolences to the family of Prince Mangosu Tukutelez, to the IFP, and to all who loved him so dearly. Prince Butelez, affectionately known to many of us as Shenge, observed that no one had a bird large enough to ride two horses. He understood this because, on the one hand, he had to be the prince, the prime minister of the Zulu monarch and protect and preserve the interest of the Zulu nation. At the same time, he was committed to advancing national interest. He served as a cabinet minister in this government and in the government led by uh, President Nelson Mandela. He was also a very long standing member. Mm. So, uh, mams, mams, hey. This is disturbing. I'm sorry, Babu. No, no, it's fine. Some of these things are expected at times like this, Chair. Uh, he was also a very long standing member of this very house. He was a great balancing act in South African politics. The hardest part for him was to navigate being both IFP leader and maintaining a strong connection with the ANC. He wanted very much to be reconciled with the ANC. His lasting legacy was in his, in his struggle in 1993 for a federalist state. While most of the parties at Codesa favored a unitary state, Prince Butelezi's insistence on federalism led to a compromise which allowed for a system of cooperative governments, uh, governance to be adopted. Mm -hmm. Chapter three of our constitution captures much of what Prince Butelezi strove for. We in the Congress of the People also thank him for the support he lent to the efforts in, 2020, in 2013 to establish a multi-party coalition involving 11 parties represented at that time in this house. We thank him for his unstinging service to the nation. May his soul rest in peace. And I thank you. Uh, Honorable Nyonso, are you there? Uh, okay. Honorable Hendricks. Uh, 
Honorable House Chair, thank you very much. The family of Prince Katsabutalezi has brought light to this chamber. The Prince Mangasutu Katsabutalezi was indeed a history maker, both before the new dispensation and during his term as an honorable member of parliament. We recognize his political talent, some of which many of us learned from and grew. He was a dedicated Anglican and as a young man in, embarked on politics under the influence of Chief Albert de Tully, he embraced fatherhood. It was thus not surprising that he helped to deliver South Africa's negotiated settlement albeit the challenges and took on the role of a cabinet minister and elderly statesman. We need more elderly statesmen. There were times when he was entrusted by former President Mandela to the role of acting president of South Africa, the highest office in the land, and he served his two terms as home affairs minister responsibility, responsibly. He was a strong leader of the Inkata Freedom Party, and debunked the claim by Afrikaner nationalists that their policy for an independent Republic of KZN had the full support of the Zulu nation. He did not want KZN to be the 55th country of Africa. Al Zamawa remembered this prince for his role as a responsible member of parliament and who consulted wisely on all matters. Al Zamawa thanks the governing party, the African National Congress, for honoring a great South African in befitting ways, and for the speaker taking parliament to the homestead of Chief Putelezi, uh, the revered prince of Africa. We now look forward to his son, the new prince, to continue his legacy. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now invite the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, Mampando. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Madam Chairperson, Honorable Members. The loss of one of our longest serving politicians, Prince Mangosutu Butelezi, has left, left a vacuum in our parliament and in our nation. On behalf of the African National Congress, we would like to extend our deepest condolences to his family and the people of KwaZulu-Natal, as well as his party, the IFP. Shenge, as he was fondly known by many, was many things, but we can all agree that he was a towering figure, both in the Zulu nation and within the country as a whole. At the ripe old age of 95, he had truly lived his life to the fullest, having served as a member of this post-democratic parliament until the age of 95. His legacy is one of service to his people, having dedicated more than seven decades to public service. He was always committed to servant leadership, self-help, and self-reliance. And his dream until the end of his life was to create a just, prosperous, and moral society whose citizens engage with each other on the basis of respect and ubuntu. The history of Prince Butelesi had often been entwined with that of the African National Congress. Prince Butelesi's uncle was one of the founders of the African National Congress, Dr. Pixley Kaisa Kaseme, and he used to assist Dr. Seme with writing correspondence while he was studying for his matric. Seme had been an advisor to the prince's uncle, King Solomon Gadinizu. Prince Butelezi was a close and dear friend of my father, Joe Matthews. This friendship dated back to 1948 when they both attended the University of Fort Hare. And in fact, Prince Butelezi was the best man of my mother and father when they got married. They were both members of the Fort Hare branch of the ANC Youth League, were both political activists and were inspired by men such as Oliver Tambo and Albert Lutuli. Chief Lutuli would often visit Prince Butelezi's uncle, 
the Zulu regent at the palace in which he grew up. My father and Prince Butelezi were bound by a great love for law, history, music, and politics. At the time, my grandfather was the vice principal of the University of Fortier, and he's the one who expelled Prince Butelezi. And he taught both students Roman Dutch law and criminal law. After Prince Butelezi completed his legal studies and began working as a clerk, he began attending political rallies and was mentored by Chief Lutuli and formed close bonds with leaders such as Oliver Tambo, Walter Sisulu, and Nelson Mandela. Prince Butelezi often reported that it was on the instruction of Chief Lutuli and Tambo who believed that Prince Butelezi could undermine the apartheid system from within that he took up leadership of the Zulu Territorial Authority, later becoming Chief Minister of KwaZulu-Natal. In 1971, Oliver Tambo announced that the enemy's own creation, the Zulu Bantustan, have become battlegrounds of freedom, where the true representatives of the people are fighting the racists and rejecting their regime. In 1974, with the ANC, PAC, and other political organization, organizations having been banned on the advice uh, on the advice of President Kaunda, and with the support of Oliver Tambo, Prince Butelezi was called upon to form a membership-based organization to reignite political mobilization within the borders of South Africa, while our leaders were in prison or in exile. Prince Butelezi thus established the Encanta Freedom Party as a cultural liberation movement in 1979. During the dark days of apartheid, Prince Butelezi held rallies under the banner Free Mandela, openly calling for the re release of President Mandela and other political prisoners, as well as the unbanning of political organizations that were forced to operate in exile. When Madiba was released from prison in 1990, he spoke of the contribution made by the prince in ensuring that he and other political prisoners were set free and that political organizations operating from exile were unbanned and allowed to come back home. Of course, we all know, as has been said earlier, that both the African National Congress and the Ngata Freedom Party would always grieve the loss of over 20,000 black lives in the civil war that raged in KwaZulu-Natal between members of the UDF, the African National Congress and the IFP and other organizations in the 1980s and early 1990s. He wouldn't want us to brush history. Revelations that the apartheid regime provided arms to the IFP during this time remained a source of tension between the two parties. It is an issue that President Mandela attempted to rise above in his own quest for national reconciliation. Prince Butelezi and my own father remained close friends throughout their lives. It was Prince Butelezi who paid tribute to my father after he passed away in 2010. And he did so again in the National Assembly and at a memorial service here in parliament. So it is indeed a, an honor for me to be one of those asked by my chief whip to pay tribute to Prince Butelezi. He was also extremely kind to me and took us on as though we were his children once we had lost our parents. He attended family events where he was very careful about what he ate and was present at my PhD graduation and extremely proud that I had pursued it beyond the age of 60. When people remember Prince Butelezi, they often describe him as a committed tra a traditional leader, a conservationist, family man, a man of faith, and a humanitarian. He was considered a lifelong humanitarian dedicated to the upliftment of his people through education and economic empowerment. What is less said is his role as a conservationist who supported rhino conservation and initiatives to save the ocean. Under his leadership, 
the IFP, IFP spoke out about the impact of shark nets on the oceans and the horrors of captive lion hunting. Prince Butelezi was a patron of the Rhino and Elephant Foundation, the Wildlands Conservation Trust, and the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project. These organizations will surely carry out his legacy of conservation for many years to come. His faith in God has been spoken about, so I will not reiterate it, but I must indicate that throughout his life, he maintained the tradition of morning and evening prayers, which spanned all his life. Throughout his 29 years as a member of parliament and as leader of the IFP's caucus, he was often the voice of reason when tensions ran high in the National Assembly. Over his parliamentary career, he attempted to get the IFP to play the role of a constructive opposition and was never afraid to speak his mind, but also played the role, Honorable Ndrozi, of a bridge builder across the divide. He played a significant role in the struggle for freedom in our country and made a contribution to creating a better democratic South Africa for all our people, and we would never forget this. He holds the record of being the only party leader sufficiently organized and efficient to provide his speech to leaders in every key national debate before the speech was delivered, always accompanied by the most beautifully written note and in an envelope addressed to the recipient, a man of order, a man of efficiency. May he rest in peace, and may his family be comforted. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Honorable members, that concludes the speaker's list on this matter. I take it that there are no objections to the motion being adopted. Will members rise to observe a moment of silence in the memory of Prince Mangosutu Butelezi? Thank you. You may be seated. The presiding officers associate themselves with the motion. The condolences of the house will be conveyed to the Butelezi family. Thank you very much. The second item on the order paper is a motion in the name of the Honorable A.M. Sheikh Imam. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. On behalf of the National Freedom Party, I move that this house on a motion of con uh, condolences on the late former member of parliament, Honorable Christopher Howard Sibisi. As we all aware, Honorable Christopher Howard Sibisi, a former principal, joined the National Freedom Party in 2017 and in 2019, he joined this Honourable House as a Member of Parliament, having served in various portfolios and unfortunately at the age of 53 succumbed to some illness. In fact, he was unwell for a short period of time before he passed on. I so move. Thank you. As we welcome the Sibisi family, I would like now to call on Dr. Gondre to open the condolence motions. Okay, uh, before you speak, honorable members, if you are late, make sure you don't speak when you switch on your, 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 your gadget, please. You really are disturbing this process in the house. And ICT, anyone whose mic is open, just mute now. 
anyone whose mic is open, just mute it now, please, and help us. Thank you. Proceed, uh, Honorable Gondwe. House Chairperson, three days before his passing, on Sunday, the 15th of October, at exactly five past seven in the evening, the late Honorable Christopher Mzwake Howard Sibisi posted a message on the WhatsApp group of the Portfolio Committee on Public Service and Administration. The message was addressed to Ms. Ndombi Dia, the committee assistant, and started with the following words. Good evening, Ms. Ndombi. I wish to apologize about tomorrow. In this particular message, House Chairperson, Honorable Sibisi was apologizing for having to miss the public hearings on two bills that the committee is presently considering. The public hearings, House Chairperson, were scheduled to be held the next day. After Honorable Sibisi tendered his apology and explained that he had been admitted to hospital, individual members of the committee proceeded to wish him well, not knowing that they were in actual fact bidding him their final farewell. However, what is really remarkable in touching House Chairperson is that despite being admitted to hospital for a serious condition, Honorable Sibisi made what must have been an arduous effort to respond to each and every member who wished him well. House Chairperson, this singular act on the part of Honorable Sibisi was a testament to his character. He was not only polite and well-managed, but also considerate and kind. House Chairperson, Ubovungani's humaneness and kindness also manifested itself in how he made an effort to greet and acknowledge everyone before our committee meetings. He would even go out of his way to make a witty remark or say something humorous before the start of our meetings, all in an effort to make everyone feel at ease. I have to also add, House Chairperson, that he was extremely quick to laugh at his own jokes. He had this copious laugh or chuckle that we will all sorely miss. House Chairperson, I further recall how he would avidly raise the various public service related issues emanating from his province and his particular constituency during the course of our engagements with the relevant department. This House Chairperson was indicative of the high regard he had for the people he was elected to represent and their daily struggles. Ubo Vungani, House Chairperson, also took his parliamentary responsibilities and duties in a serious light. Despite sitting on multiple committees, including the portfolio committees on basic education and sports, arts and culture, we really felt his absence as a committee because when it mattered the most, Ubo Vungani would avail himself and would enthusiastically and keenly participate in committee deliberations. House Chairperson, born on the 27th of July in a place called Skuman, the late Honorable Sibisi was the first born of Ubaba, Jabulani, and Umama Temba Makumalu Sibisi. He attended Rankes Flakta Primary School for his primary school education and progressed to Ntonjeni High School for his secondary school education. After completing his matric, at Intonjeni High School, he studied towards and subsequently obtained a bachelor's degree in education from the University of Zululand. At the time of his passing house chairperson, he was in the process of pursuing a degree in political science from Wits University. House chairperson, even though we will miss Ubo Vungani, we know and acknowledge in our hearts of hearts that he has now embarked on a journey that none of us can escape or delay once it's a time to embark on this journey. The late American civil rights activist and Baptist minister, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. put it so eloquently when he said, every man must do two things alone. He must do his own believing and his own dying. As such, all that we can really say is to the leadership and supporters of his political abode, the National Freedom Party where he served as Acting Secretary General for the Interim NEC of the party, please accept our sincerest and heartfelt condolences. We are grieving with you. To his wife, Mantombela, their five daughters, Akona, Anele, Zanda, Oluetu, Oluami, Homotehang, Yamukelan, may the following words of the great Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter eight, verses 38 to 39, console you during this difficult and trying time. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
the passing of our brother and colleague Bovungani has therefore not separated you, Mantombela, and your daughters from the love that God has for you. He loves you and is fervently watching over you, and he'll continue to comfort and strengthen you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm told Honorable Komani will take the slot for EFF. Mam Komani. Thank you very much, Chair. Chairperson, I rise on behalf of the Economic Freedom Fighters to convey our deepest condolences to the wife, children, surviving siblings, and the ent entire CBC family. We further send our condolences to the NFP, the, the organization that he was the acting SD of, the people of Utugela region in particular, and the country for the loss of this giant. Mr. Sibisi was a father, a husband, a brother who loved his family so much. And for them, he would stop everything and protect them. Chairperson, we served with Mr. Sibisi in the Portfolio Committee of Public Service and Administration. And because of his experience as a public servant, he engaged and assisted this committee so well. We stand here, Chairperson, speaking of a person who was very dedicated to his work and who gave, who gave all to our portfolio committee and who was not even afraid to tell the truth, even when he knew it would be overlooked by the majority. Chairperson, it is very sad to be the farewell to a person of this caliber because really there was still more that we expected from him. The courage and the energy, though soft, he had when he engaged was indeed that of a principal. He was one person who would always say his heart out and was not afraid of criticism. And he was also not afraid to criticize people, especially when that criticism was uh, uh, important. Che, Mr. CBC had a much needed personality which he used to unite and even in heated discussions in the committee he would be able to rise and provide solutions. And his passion and love for the people is what always brought solutions. And that is one thing that we will miss dearly. Chairperson, we stand here today confident that Mr. CBC never disappointed because he was really fit for the responsibilities that he was that was bestowed in on him. And indeed, he delivered to his best. Finally, Chairperson, we would like to remind the CBC family, particularly Mandombela, that God's plans superseded our plans. As he has cut Mr. CBC's life, life short with us, as he had better plans for him away from this world. And so, uh, for that, Chairperson, we say, so thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Or, uh, thank you, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. As the IFP, we would like to express our sincere uh, sympathy following the unexpected passing of Honorable CBC, a leader who was wholly dedicated to his cause and the people of this country in the best way that uh, the political climate permitted him. Chair, you will agree with me that uh, as a nation, we are experiencing one of the most challenging ends to the year. Throughout uh, 2023, we have seen untimely demise in some of the sharpest leaders this house has seen since uh, the dawn of democracy. Although deeply saddened by this loss, I also personally feel very privileged and honored to have had the opportunity to serve alongside the Honorable CBC even before his deployment in this house in, in 2019. As I stand here uh, today, I call upon other honorable members and citizens of this country from all walks of life to not only join me in mourning, but also reflect with me on the contributions of Honorable CBC as not just a politician, but also as a teacher who positively shaped 
the lives of pupils in rural areas of Wazul Natal. As this uh, going is pro proving to get uh, tougher and tougher, I implore every one of us here today to stand steadfast in our commitment to serving the citizens of this country, to do so with honor, truth, transparency, dedication, and most importantly, to the best of uh, our abilities as we continue to lead to one of the best nations in the world. Despite all this, let us hold, hold on to the promise of the American proverb that the only ones who are truly dead are those who have been forgotten. Uh, by, I, my, my, in my conclusion, may we all remember RSPC for the values he stood and, 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 and lived for. And may his soul rest in peace, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Akbara, as Voorzitter. Honorable House Chair, losing a loved one, friend, or colleague is never easy, and it reminds one of the, how short and fragile life actually is. It also reminds us that we should live every day as if it's our last day on earth. We should ask ourselves the question what will people remember about me when I'm no longer around? What is my legacy and what impression have I left on those around me? Honorable Sibisi was always friendly and polite towards me with where, wherever our paths crossed, here in Parliament and in the committees. He was a soft-spoken, hard-working, kind and respectable man and left a positive impression on me as a colleague and as a human being. He was also quite funny, always being ready with a joke. To his loved ones, I'm sure that the impression he has left on them is even more profound. On behalf of the FF+, Plus, may you and his friends and colleagues in the National Freedom Party find comfort in the words spoken here today and strength for the road ahead. I leave you, his loved ones, with the words of Jack Thorne. Those we loved never truly leave us. There are certain things that death cannot touch. May he rest in perfect peace. Rest in Friede. House Chair, I thank you. It seems people don't want to get used to these chairs that we put for <laughs> them here. Yeah, proceed, Ma. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable Chair, the ACDP wish to extend our sincere condolences to the family of Honorable Christopher Howard Mzwake CBC. Your loss as a family will be most profound because the deepest ties that binds us are those of love, family, and friendship. May you receive grace as you travel this road of loss and grief. We wish to further extend our condolences to the National Freedom Party, his political home, and to those who work closely with him. We live in a time of great shaking, and the loss of Mr. Sabisi would be to many who relied on him, a shaking and realignment of their lives. There is but one solace in times of chaos and loss, and I wish to bless you with the words of an ancient hymnal that reads, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, the solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. The ACDP wants to bestow on you the peace and the love of Christ in your time of loss. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. The United Democratic Movement extends its heartfelt sympathies and condolences 
to the family, friends, and the loved ones of Mr. Christopher, excuse me, Howard Mzwa KCBC, and his party, the National Freedom Party. Christopher Mzwa KCBC served as a member of parliament from 2019 until he passed away in October 2023. And I've had the privilege of working with him throughout the period. Uh, firstly, in his capacity as member of various committees here in Parliament, and secondly, in his capacity as also an opposition party leader, with whom I had have had to interact about quite a number of issues that affect us as the opposition coalition, collection rather, and issues that also affect our work here in Parliament. He was a member of the, he was appointed as the acting secretary general of the party in 2019. And in that capacity as well, I've worked very closely with him on quite a number of issues. It is a very big and a sad loss for the Parliament of the Republic of South Africa, his family, uh, together with his political party, the National Freedom Party. And I would like to extend my heartfelt condolences to him. I told him. In conclusion, <clears throat> a poem by Kelly Roper after the funeral. Kelly Roper says, tomorrow is a new day, the first of many that I'll face without you beside me, without your strength, without your wit, without your grace, but I'll have to find a way to carry on, drawing from the lessons learned from you and the warm memories that they leave you, he leaves behind. The Ichwa Lendo to the family and his political party, the NFP, that they have to draw from his teachings and memories that he leaves them behind as a way of moving forward. Thank you. Mama Khao. Uh, thank you very much, House Chair, and greetings to CBC family. ATM conveys heartfelt condolences to the wife of CBC and children and NFP as well. This house lost a dedicated servant leadership, a well-mannered servant, a former principal who served in various committees of the house and will use his experience in advancing the better life for all. The house lost a soldier, a dedicated leader, a man with love of his family. We are saying to the family, their loss is ours. And to the NFPC, Utiko Agatatindo Angabekindo, on behalf of African Transformation Movement, Siti Kumdeni, Akustanga Lunge Shanga, Malula Lenge Naiba, Utsiko Uzobako, Naiba Nweta Ngao Onge Amataisha, Enko Sahoshi. Togoze, Shri Honorable Sheikh Iman. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Allow me to acknowledge the president, uh, presence of Situle and Zbashle. You know, normally you'll call them the terrible twins, but these are beautiful little twins of CBC that are sitting here in the house today. Right. Honorable House Chair, Chairperson Christopher CBC attended his early education at Ranches Primary School and completed his secondary education at the Tonjani High School in Driefontein, Ladysmith in KwaZulu Natal. And after having completed his metric, he went on to study at the University of Zululand, where he obtained his bachelor's degree in education, after which he began his stint as a teacher. From 20, 2002 until he resigned as a school principal in 2019. He resigned as a school principal to begin his political career, which he started at the National Freedom Party, and then he became the acting secretary general on the interim national executive committee of the party. Yeah, not much time. I see 50 seconds, be that as it may. Yes, after becoming a member of uh, in 2019 of this honorable house, and as you've correctly heard from many of our colleagues who worked with him in different portfolios, how committed and dedicated honorable CB has, CBC has been. But over and above that, I want to say that there was another side to our Honorable CBC. He was very committed and dedicated to the constituency that he served. And also importantly, something that I didn't know about him as well, he took care of a lot of people, including his family, but more importantly, extended families 
you know, and, and, and something which was very remarkable. So on behalf of the National Freedom Party, we want to extend our condolences to his entire, entire family, both locally and abroad, his beautiful five children that he left behind, and we're calling on the children to follow in the footsteps of their father and ensure that his legacy lives on. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Thank you. Honorable Hendricks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, House Chair, Al Jabari members, Mr. Chris, Christopher Zabisi, as a dedicated honorable member of parliament who served his party, the National Freedom Party, and his constituencies very well. We knew the late Mr. Zabisi for a few years since we appointed one of their leaders as a deputy mayor of Escort and uh, one of their members as a PR counselor, throwing them a lifeline uh, when they failed to pay their election deposits in the 200 and 2016 municipal elections. Mrs. Abishu will be remembered as a hard worker who also served on several committees. Azama would like to thank the portfolio committee members who send him good wishes on his dying bed. Alzama extends its condolences to the Sabishi family, the NFP, and all those he serves. His daughters must be proud of their dad, especially the beloved twins who are in Parliament and who I say they rock. Thank you very much. Thank you. My apologies, uh, Honorable Jafta. I Thank you, Honorable Jafta. Honorable Chair, as the AIC, we wish to pass our condolences to the family of the late Comrade CBC. Honorable CBC joined our parliament after the 2019 general elections. He served in the Portfolio Committee on Public Service and Administration, the Portfolio Committee on Basic Education, and was the alternate member of the Portfolio Committee on Employment and Labor. His role in the Portfolio Committee on Public Service and Administration was exceptional. We note that he was a proponent of digital technology. In one of the meetings with the Department of Public Service and Administration, he inquired from the department about the pace of the organizational functionality assessment tool. The tool is used to measure public services performance in its specific capabilities. It, it is meant to improve the efficiency and quality of services rendered. Honorable CBC also questioned the department about its process in infusing modern technology in public service. In 2019, he made a sterling contribution on the Portfolio Committee on Employment and Labor, BRRRs. In this debate, Honorable CBC encouraged gender parity in accordance with the department's gender equity plan to combat gender inequality in the workplace. Honorable CBC was committed to the struggle of women and lived by this motto. His commitment to our democracy cannot be understated. Uh, under, uh, May his soul uh, be spared. I thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you. Mam Kweb, Thank you very much, House Chair, Honorable Members, the BCBC family. We meet here today to mourn a loss for the nation. And as members of parliament, a colleague we interacted with in the execution of our constitutional obligations as a representative of the people. The African National Congress pays its respect and condolences to the departed patriot. We mourn with the family whose pain in this situation cannot be meshed with ours because what we feel is far less compared to what they are going through in their time of mourning. We are about to conduct the public hearings on the 17th and the 18th of October on the bills before the Portfolio Committee of Public Service and Administration. Honorable Christopher Howard Smith sent a message of apology to the committee's WhatsApp group informing us that he was consulting the medical practitioner at the hospital on the 17th. Being the free spirit that he was, he made what he was going through look so mundane. In hindsight, 
we realize that we are saying his goodbye. So we do not get shocked when we hear the news of his departure. He absorbed our shock by making it look so easy. This was the orientation of his spirit and intentions, even in the committee work. He took things with a lot of understanding that the person is the same, a, a being in the world, which is the philosophy by Martin, the German existentialist philosopher. Honorable Sibis existed in community with us as colleagues in the portfolio committee. Political differences did not make him an enemy, but he was an opponent who conducted himself within the decorum of parliament. He will differ with politeness and respect. He fully understood that in politics, the difference can be ideological, but issues we grapple with concerning the people we, with, we represent are material. Society is the same as much as political representation is different. He understood that when there is no peculiarity in issues, there must be a common approach to work together to achieve a common good. That is what we admired about him. He served on the three committees in the National Assembly, being our portfolio committee and sports, basic education and others. He will not participate frequently within us, but he did, he made it meaningful. He would always serve on the subcommittee to recruit and recommend national commissioners of the Public Service Commission. When we have agreed on a principle, he would not want us to go back on it. However, he will hint without making anyone feel less than. He will respect the decorum of the meeting. He never did things or conducted himself with showmanship and political expediency. To him, it was always about the constituency we represent and the common problems they face as communities and society, not as particular group of people. We will surely miss his integrity to serve. He respected all of us and focused on issues to be addressed by all of us as a collective, not poking holes where there were none. To the members of his family, especially the, his wife, Mandombela and the children, we say to them, Lalani ngeba uka kanjenge nyongo kepa anina kulinika mtu usizilwenu tutuzelekani kuba nati sinitualise intunguyenu. Whenever you reminisce about him, he remi be reminded of his natural smile and laughter, as well as his seriousness when issues to be dealt with. Have that heart and strength to tackle your issues like he would if we were around. Be reminded of all these sweet words from his colleagues today, that he was still the same person he was with you, even when we were not uh, looking. With these words, I thank you, the family, for loaning us his service to the nation. We know that being a public representative also impacts quality family time. To his political home, the National Freedom Party, where he was its NEC member and the Secretary General, we say, also remember him for what he did for your organization to represent you within the society and this august house take the pattern he held dearly to his heart and run with it to finish the course he has started thank you very much honorable members that concludes the speaker's list on this matter I take it there are no objections to the motion being adopted. We will, will members please rise to observe a moment of silence in the memory of Mr. Christopher Howard Mzoake Sibisi. Thank you very much. You may be seated. The presiding officers associate themselves with the motion and the condolences of the house will be conveyed to the CBC family. Honorable members, the third order, the third item on the order paper is member statement. Does any member of the ANC wish to make a statement? 
Thank you, Honorable House Chair. South Africa became the first rugby team to win the Rugby World Cup four times, 1995, 2007, 2019, and 2023, when they defeated New Zealand 12-11 on Saturday, the 28th of October, 2023, at Stade de France. The, spring the Springboks showed determination, creativity, resilience, strength, and patriotism against the All Blacks in the difficult and nail-biting final match. As the country, we are proud of the mighty Springboks under the leadership of Captain Sia Colisi for gifting us an extraordinary, inspired and inspiring national achievement to lift our morale and spirit of patriotism. They have earned South Africa's name in the annals of history. Our, our, our unwavering confidence in them was symbolized by the, presen by the presence of President Cyril Ramaphosa in France to support the Springboks and help them lift, lift the Webb Ellis Trophy. President Ramaphosa also lifted the trophy with the Springboks in 2019 and will lift it again in 27 for the fifth time. We would like to thank the supporters and fans, from celebrities to, lip, to, lip, to religious leaders, royalty, political leaders, academics, and other sporting stars for echoing the slogan, Stronger Together. Thank you. Thank you. Diborge, Diborge. How now, Lilunga, look press a Leo Michael up, Pocon. Massa wins. The DA. Thank you, Chairperson. Last week, the Minister of Finance tabled the medium term budget policy statement. It set out the consequences of government's dismal failure to stimulate economic growth to generate jobs, keep debt under control, and manage government spending. Failed economic policy has slowed our growth and resulted in less revenue and entirely avoidable cuts to spending on service delivery. In the week before his statement, the DA handed a memorandum to the minister asking him to respond to the cost of living crisis, where 81% of households are skipping at least one meal a day. 12 million people go to bed hungry every night. 30% of children under age five are stunted in their development. And millions of hungry school children are unable to concentrate and learn. The minister did not mention the action plan cabinet mandated the economic cluster to develop to enhance food security and accessibility. Where is the plan? The minister did not mention the cost of living, not once. He could have cut the tax and levies on fuel and expanded the zero VAT rated food basket. Instead, we have the uncertainty of looming tax increases. There is no response from the ANC government because it simply doesn't care about the plight of battling South African households. Minister, do you know that the people are hungry and do you care enough to do something about it? Thank you. EFF. Thank you, House Chair. House Chair, the EFF has been the lone voice in exposing the corruption at the Department of Employment and Labor. We were the first and only party to point out that the minister tabled legislation in parliament to protect corruption at the compensation fund and called on the Hawks to investigate the former commissioner for corruption. We're the only party that spoke consistently about the corruption at the UIF. All the fraudulent claims against the UIF were made possible because there were senior people internally who facilitated the fraud and corruption. We want that the fraud and corruption at the Department of Employment and Labor, the Compensation Fund and the UIF is only possible because the minister was involved. Such high levels of corruption will not be possible without the minister playing a role. Three of his senior officials at the UIF were fired during the COVID-19 era. The former commissioner of the compensation fund left after so much damage had been done because of our warnings were ignored. The DG at the, of the department is also living under a, a, a dark cloud, yet the minister remains seemingly the only clean one. If not for corruption, the minister must be removed for incompetence. Worse, Minister Tulas Nguesi must be arrested for being a, 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 compli a compliance to all the corruption and fraud that has happened at the Department of Employment and Labor. 
We are not shocked, Chairperson, that the five billion deal at the UIF. Honorable, thank you. Honorable uh, Khadebe. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The member has just breached Rule 85 by calling for the minister to be arrested. She, she must bring a, a substantive motion in the House. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yes. Within our time. members, uh, that uh, order is uh, sustained because we know that uh, in case of things that we read or something, if you have to put, um, uh, you have to come with a substantive motion, please let's do that. Because we will blame everybody every day because of what we get from the media and read about it. Thank you. Uh, honorable members, we now go to the ANC. Thanks, Chair. The ANC congratulates South Africa's national men's cricket team, the Proteus, for qualifying to play in the semi finals of the Cricket World Cup in India. The Proteus defeated New Zealand on Wednesday, 1st November 2023, smashing the Black Caps by 190 runs and confirming their spot in semi finals with two round-robin matches to spare. Quinton de Kock produced yet another remarkable performance that saw him register a fourth century at this year's tournament and also becoming the first South African batter to score 500 runs at a single World Cup. The Proteus have done us proud with their performance at the 2023 World Cricket World Cup. We commend them for flying the South African flag high. Although they lost in their clash against host India on Sunday, the Proteus remain second on the lock and have already qualified for the semifinals. We call upon South Africans to rally behind Proteus as they did with the Springboks. I thank you. Thank you. The IFP. Honourable Speaker, Today, I rise with a heavy heart to address an urgent crisis that bright on our higher education system, the alarming collapse of a national student fund, national student financial aid scheme, and its de devastating impact on our university students. The crisis demands our immediate attention, and I call upon the minister to take full responsibility of this failure. Considering the impact implication of his leadership, and step down. The NSFAS was established with the noble intention of providing financial support to underprivileged students and grant them the opportunity to pursue their higher education. Regrettably, it now stands as a mere shadow of its noble purpose. Our students, the future of our nation, are suffering gravely due to the inefficiency and mismanagement within the institution. As we speak, Many university students are willing, are writing their exams on an empty stomach, unable to afford their meals or basic necessity. Their dream, of, their dream of a brighter future are being crushed under the weight of hunger and despair. This is not just a matter of statistics. These are the, the lives of our, of our youth, and we cannot turn a blind eye on their sufferings. The collapse of NS, uh, NSFAS goes beyond the economic replication. It erodes the social fabrics of our nation. It undermines the principles of equality. Your time is up. Uh, thank you. FF Plus. Geachte voorzitter. <clears throat> the Vrije Front Plus het kennis geneem van vier Suid-Afrikaanse pianiste wat in 2024 die geleendheid gaan kry om hulle self in internationale standaarde te meet wanneer hulle aan die 15e Inisa internationale klaviercompetitie in Pretoria gaan meeden. Drie competitie gaan plaas van in die tijdperk van 22 januari tot en met 3 februari 2024 in Pretoria. Hierdie die pianiste gaan al in al onderskye afdelings te staan kom die pianiste van Britannia, Spanje, Suid-Korea, Japan, Israel, Belarus, Rusland, Duitsland, China, Thailand en die VSA. Die VF Plus wil graag van die regeleentheid gebruik maak om aan Gerard Joubert, Isaac van der Merwe, Brevio van Skalpek en Zibusisu Makatini alle sterkte en succes hiermee toe te wens. Mag die kunst in Zuid-Afrika van kracht tot kracht gaan. Dankie, voorzitter. Dankie, ANC. 
Thank you very much, Chairperson. We welcome the initiative by the Premier of Houghton in partnership with ESCOM and the City Power, aimed at restoring transformers in township that have not been had power in Houghton province. Some areas in the province have had malfunctioning transformer for some time, but now they're receiving new transformers, which will ease their electricity levels. Power Utility ESCOM and the province are carrying out the transformer replacement program launched last month. The new transformers consist of new smart meters to cap illegal connections and the purchase of electricity from unauthorized vendors. The NC calls for community of Houghton to take responsibility and safeguard their infrastructure, reporting the illegal connection and cable theft to their authorities. I thank you. Thank you. The DA. Thank you, Chairperson. I rise today to address a pressing issue that plagues the Germiston area within my constituency. For long periods of time, our community has been deprived of one of the most fundamental needs, access to clean water. This dire situation is a result of critical shortages of water supply from the Rand water, which plays a vital role in providing water to the municipality within Ekuraleni. A blame game between the municipality and the Rand water has erupted, each pointing fingers at each other. But what we need right now is swift, decisive action. The incompetence and mismanagement that have brought us to this point is unexcusable. The lack of consequence management only exacerbates the problem, leaving our constituents in a vulnerable and dire situation. As we speak, our children are sitting for their end of year exams and the lack of access to water not only disrupts their studies, but also undermines the basic human rights as enshrined in our constitution. Clean water is not a luxury, it's a fundamental right, and our residents are suffering due, its, due to its unavailability. This is not just a local issue, it's a matter of national concern within the broader South African context. It highlights the urgent need for the comprehensive approach to address the challenges facing our water supply systems and to ensure accountability at every level of government. In conclusion, I call on the ANC government to get their house in order and urgently address this very urgent matter. Thank you. Essential services Your time is are up. at risk. Thank you. Thank you. ACDP. Uh, Chairperson, the ACDP welcomes the opportunity presented by the recalling of South African diplomats from Tel Aviv to consult government on the current war between Israel and Palestine. We believe it is important that South Africans be truthfully informed regarding recent developments in the Middle East. It is a known fact that this war where many innocent lives have and continue to be lost was started by Hamas. When Hamas abducted, raped, paraded, and killed innocent people, South Africa did not condemn their actions but when Israel responded to the atrocious acts, the ANC government was quick to condemn their actions. The international community is fully aware that Hamas does not recognize the state of Israel and wants the state annihilated. During the 1967 Arab League summit that was held on the 29th of August in Khartoum, the summit took a resolution that became famous as the three no's. No peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, no negotiation with Israel. So how does one then broker a peace settlement with somebody who does not acknowledge your existence? House Jefferson, it is no secret that Hamas uses places like hospitals and other Thank things you. of his kind. Your time is up. Thank you. The ANC. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, House Chair. The African. The point African of order, Chair. Order, 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 point order, order, order. Point of order, Chair. Point, chair, point of order. 
Oh, uh, Honourable Thrin, yes. Chair, it would be proper for members from the EFF to withdraw their comments, calling the leader of the ACDP uh, by improper names. Um, the, if if the ACDP would begin to call the oh, EFF uh, uh, ignorant, uh, wait. Uh, uh, they must be prepared to actually take the, uh, wait. the insult. That, now you are debating. Where did they do that? We didn't hear them. And please, if there is something like that, just write and then put that complaint. It was the Honorable Ndlozi. There's no one of the members of FF here. No one. Honorable Thring, that's not how it works. Uh, because it's not here on the platform. And if Honorable Ndlozi had long left the, the platform and a point of order must be immediately after that. So please... Ongang Fagila Pongagwas. Honorable Chair. Can we allow the Honorable. Who's that? There's somebody who's calling. The chair, it's it's me, Honorable Thring. Okay, Honorable Thring. Just the, just the correction, Chair. It actually happened after the uh, ACDP president spoke. That's why I called the point of order. It wasn't during. What? So you call the point of order now, please. No. Calling him to orders, uh, Chair. Thank you. No, Honorable Thring, don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. The rules are very straight. You must call for a point of order immediately. They must respect you, Chairperson. No, it's fine. It's fine. If there is anything you. that we did not all hear, put it on paper and submit it to the relevant uh, office as a complaint. Thank you very much. I can't rule on it because I didn't hear it. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Mpanza, please proceed. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, House Chair. Will my seconds that have been uh, wasted by... No, we're yes. starting. Don't worry. Okay. This is a useless uh, point of order. Af Chair. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. Members of the ANC, you are disturbing your own member. And I'm not going to give him time. Proceed. The African National Congress condemns uh, in the strongest possible terms the continued uh, occupation of Palestine by the Israel of uh, state of Israel. The recent events which saw the state of Israel escalating attacks on Gaza and West Bank are but the latest in a series of atrocities against the people of Palestine in violation of international law. Israel continued bombardment of Gaza and West Bank is the worst attack in the 75-year history of this conflict with the Palestinians. Israel wrongly argues that the attack by Hamas on the 7th of October 2023 justified their disproportionate and wanton destruction of Palestine homes, community facilities, matter of 8,000 Palestinians, mostly civilians, women and children. We further condemn Israel for blockading Gaza and denying food, water, electricity, fuel and health care to mil millions of intensely populated Palestinian enclave, which is the biggest open concentration camp in the world. This worsened the living conditions in an area that has reeled under a creeping siege. Thank since you. Since your time is up. Uh, seven. Free oh, oh. Palestine, free Palestine. Honorable, honorable members, order, honorable members, order. Honorable Thring, I didn't expect the shouting from you. I can't hear what you are yes, saying. Sir. I but you were point. shouting. I didn't want to disturb the speaker. Chair, Please. On a point of order. Uh, uh, okay. On a point of order. Yes, Honorable uh... Swat. 
um, Chair, when our leader was speaking, yes. I could hardly hear him where I was sitting here because they were, he was being shouted at continually. So our leader was not protected earlier, and so it is only fair that we are also allowed. Honorable uh, uh, Swart, but unfortunately, we... if I hear noise, I come in after. Chair, and yeah. that is why I didn't stop Honorable Thring May I appear and to speak you? after. May... And I'm sorry if I didn't hear the noise that was made to talk about it after. Thank you. Chair. Thank you. Yes, uh, Honorable. Um... Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I... I hope I'm not going to be misinterpreted about the point of what I'm about to raise, but I'm rising, Chair, to indulge you on Rule 91, mm -hmm. that if you, the rule of anticipation, there is a statement that the Minister of International Relations is going to be making on this matter after this. Now we've already had two member statements on this matter. Is there now an expectation for the minister to respond to these statements and then debate again. I think there may be a need for guidance, uh, Chair, on what happens Okay. The statements which anticipate Honourable, I Thank hear you. you. Chair. Yeah, no. I think you, uh, on Rule 90, that you talk about no member may anticipate the discussion of a matter. We are dealing now with statements and we can't stop people from speaking. Uh, let me just say that, as we know, a parliamentary program is prepared uh, in advance of every sitting of members should be mindful of the parameters associated therewith. Maybe that's what we should be looking at as a belief. I know that we can't stop people from making statements. Uh, ATM. Um, thank you, Chair. We'll participate in the debate. We don't have a statement for now. Thank you. Thank you. The ANC. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The negative reports will not deter the ANC, but will galvanize it. Contrary to the recent negative voices that predict an ANC loss in the 2024 general elections, the recent by-elections in Eteguini, News Ward 9, and other by-elections around the country shows otherwise. These types of negative predictions that ANC will lose elections started as early as the second and third general elections in 1999, and 2004, respectively. The ANC achieved 67.8% and 7% in these general elections, respectively. The ANC took the word from the DA by a big margin in an outcome that we believe is an indication that the ANC continue to live and lead. The word encompasses Forest Hill, Waterford, and other areas. The ANC candidates, Siabo Ngamjo, Nala was victorious with 6,712 votes compared to the J's 2,587. The AFF received 127 votes, and the Africa Restoration Alliance only received 17 votes. This victory shows that majority of South African voters will have confidence in the ANC to lead, and we are humbled by their support. The ANC has also laid bare the weaknesses of the micro Moonshot pact now called. Thank you. Party chapter party Thank you. Your party. time is up. Shine. The DA. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Like every South African, the DA is immensely proud of the Springboks and the historic World Cup victory. They have shown strength and persistence in face of great odds and inspired the whole country to do the same. This back-to-back -back win is even more amazing when you consider the incredible pressure, pressure the players were under. They had the World Anti-Doping Agency's threat of not being allowed to play in the South African colours hanging over their heads. And while the National Anti-Doping Organization's non-compliance and its con consequences are currently on hold until the Court of Arbitration in so Sport has made a decision, this does not excuse government's failures to adopt the latest international standard for code compliance by signatories in time. 
government had two years to ensure compliance by amending the outdated drug-free sport act something the da warned the anc government about on multiple occasions the da will do everything in our power to ensure that parliament keeps to the extended timeline to amend the act the minister must further ensure that the act is amended in time to meet the extended deadline to prevent sanctions on south african sport teams the Boca has done their part and the Proteas are busy making us proud. And let's not forget Banyana Banyana's amazing Wafkan win last year. And let's not ever let the team gender stand in the way of their compensation. Sportsmen and women have the potential to unite South Africans. Therefore, the Minister of Sports and Tourism, the Minister in the Presidency, and in particular Brand South Africa have a critical role to play in the success of sport in South Africa. South Africa's national team should be properly funded and looked after. The DA will strive to keep them playing in national colours. Thank you. The EFF. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Chairperson. Chairperson, there are many people uh, who are deliberately misunderstanding us and want us to believe that their misunderstanding of the EFF regarding the Springbok emblem is justified. They don't want to deal with the facts. We love rugby, but it is a fact that the Springbok emblem was and continues to be a symbol of Afrikaner supremacy. It is a fact that the Springbok emblem is no different from the stem in the national anthem. They both represent a continuation of apartheid era's racist white supremacy. The same way the apartheid flag is a stain on our democracy. It is a fact that the custodian of white supremacy, its continuation and its main beneficiary is Johan Rupert. That is why he's the only resident in South Africa whom the Springbok team visited on private property to present the cup. It is a fact that the Springbok rugby team is white dominated despite the fact that South Africa particularly the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape, has more black and brilliant rugby players than any other region in South Africa, yet they are a minority in a country that has a majority of African people. We don't believe that our people are celebrating a color and symbol that has its genesis in the 1906 whites-only national rugby team. These are the same colors and signs that the apartheid government in 1971 passed a law stating that the Springbok colors would strictly be awarded to white sports persons only. We are not going to be pressured to worship and glorify anti-black racist symbols just because Thank the you very much. of sport your and time is up. are happy Thank to you. do so on an international Thank stage. Thank you, Honorable Member. Your time is up. ANC. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The ANC welcomes the launch of Willis's Bridges Construction project in Port St. John's in the Eastern Cape recently. About 3.3 billion rands budget has been put aside to construct 134 Willis's Bridges in six provinces in the next three years. The sight of school children crossing swelling and dangerous rivers because of lack of bridges and infrastructure in the country's rural areas will soon be a thing of the past. This program is targeting rural provinces where well, there is a backlog in the construction of bridges, which presented a real threat to lives during rainy season. 1.1 billion per year will be spent in the Eastern Cape, which was the pilot of Willis's bridges program, followed by KwaZulu Natal, Free State, Pumalanga, Limpombo, and Northwest. The Willis's bridges project is a government project involving the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure the South African National Defense Force and the Provincial Departments of Transport. I thank you. Chief. Thank you. PAC. ANC. No statement, Chair, from the PAC. Thank you. ANC. Thank you very much, Chair. We welcome the latest initiative of the University of Fortes Faculty of Health Science which brought smiles to residents of Smiling Valley near Mtansana with a that, that, provides, that provides weekly health care services to the community. The initiative, which is a partnership between the faculty and the Eastern Cape Department of Health, comes after the university received one million rents grant from the Department of Higher Education. The initiative has brought healthcare services closer to the part of the community 
which do not have a clinic. The mobile health facility provides primary health care services such as health education, basic screening for diseases, and basic health care interventions. It is administered by students from the university's Department of Nursing Science and the Department of Rehabilitative Sciences under the supervision of qualified and professional health pr practitioners. Previously, residents used to walk more than 10 kilometers to a clinic in Mtansan in N1. The initiative has made a positive impact on the community. The project is a great example of an academic institution working with the stakeholders to make an impact on surrounding communities. The project will also imbue- Thank you very much. Your Thank time you. is up. Thanks. Before I call on the ministers to respond, as they will be showing my table staff will check the hands. Honorable members on the platform, you know, it's it's easy to make a mistake of opening your, your mics. But when the name comes and the other people are talking, it means we are not in the house anymore. We are in the street or somewhere. That is the, the, the implication thereof. And it's more painful when it happens like that, where you hear voices. We don't allow people in the house to speak that are not members, but mem people are speaking on this platform. Please be careful of what you are doing with those gadgets. Uh, we now uh, ask if there are any ministerial responses. Do you have hands there? We have uh, Deputy Minister Manamela will be the first. Please speak. Thank you. Thank you, House Chairperson. Um, we note the comments around the uh, NSFAS, and I must say that as of August this year, based on the report we received in the portfolio, which was presented in the portfolio committee, most students had already received their allowances through the uh, new student-centered model. The NSFAS has deployed teams in various uh, universities and TVET colleges uh, see, uh, uh, to deal specifically with uh, challenges of students not receiving their allowances and progress has been made in this regard. The minister has also received a report from an independent investigations uh, law firm on the process of the appointment of the financial service providers who are responsible for paying students allowances um, and the involvement of the CEO and various executives at, at, at NSFAS and will be announcing further action pending advice from the NSFAS board. We must emphasize, Honorable House Chair, that in the overall, close to 100% of students in many of the institutions have received their allowances and that those which are outstanding has to do with the status of their applications and whether those students did qualify for the National Student Financial Aid or not. And as the minister has indicated a few days ago, he, together with officials from the department, will be monitoring the situation and have asked for more focus on stabilizing issues of governance, servicing students, and opening applications for 2023. We want to assure South Africans and students in particular that the news about the collapse or crisis at the NSFAS have been greatly exaggerated and that whatever few challenges that the NSFAS is facing, we are on top of the situation. We also acknowledge the statement made by the Honorable Member uh, uh, Tlamini uh, on the role that students are playing together with uh, the uh, uh, university in setting up a clinic in a, a community. And we hope that more and more uh, you know, institutions, particularly those that are responsible for health and health sciences, will uh, continue to do that so that institutions do not remain ivory towers within the communities where they exist in. Thank you very much, House Chairperson. Thank you. The Honourable Minister Gordon. Thank you, Chairperson, and good afternoon to all of you. Um, th I want to thank uh, 
Honorable Mboyana for his uh, for the statement and uh, respond as follows. Firstly, the damage to Transformers takes place as a result of uh, illegal connections, which all of us are familiar with, vandalism and theft of Transformers as well. And this uh, kind of activity deprives communities of electricity when they most want it. Now, Eskom has been working uh, with provinces uh, and with our, our department to make sure that within the budget available uh, at Eskom, uh, these transformers are either repaired or uh, replaced. And this is a costly exercise which runs into hundreds of millions of rands. And in some instances, Chairperson, we also have Eskom's uh, distribution staff involved in some of this illegal activity. So, this program will uh, extend from Gauteng to possibly other provinces as well. We are in touch with some of them. But I want to make a call to our communities that they join us in protecting these transformers and come help us to combat and help Eskom to combat uh, the theft and damage to the transformers, that the communities should actually encourage and welcome the installation of smart meters because ultimately it will be to their benefit as well stop the illegal connections in their areas, fight cable theft, and in that way we'll make sure that even with a limited load shedding, that our communities are able to use electricity, uh, particularly at a time when students are writing exams and other critical activity is taking place. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Honorable Minister Godo. Thank you very much, House Chair. Good afternoon. I note the comments made by honorable members congratulating the performance of our national teams, particularly the Springboks on their achievement. It was President Mandela who identified the unique power of sport to unite our people and to bring us closer to the nation of our dream, which is described in the preamble of the Constitution of the Republic. It was President Mandela too who identified rugby as an instrument of national unity as well as Springboks as a symbol of reconciliation. And therefore, we must continue to make sure that we rally our support behind our national teams. It's becoming clear the demonstration of our national teams that through sport, we are achieving the elements of the dream of our nation, which is described in the constitution, in the preamble of the constitution, non-racial, democratic, sexism, non-sexism, as well as prosperous. And I think through our national teams, we're beginning to realize the elements of the, uh, of the nation of our dreams. It's important that this house must continue to support our national teams as we're now on our road to India, again to lift another cup. We must continue to rally behind the Proteas men's cricket team in the same way we've done with Amapogopogo. Our focus now is to grassroots school sport to make sure that we build a foundation for the future of the nation of our dreams, which will make sure that we achieve nation building and social cohesion. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Honorable uh, Dr. Pando. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, despite the fact that uh, Honorable Tlengwa was right with respect to the rule of anticipation, I am compelled to respond to the statements that were made by Honorable Members and to say that it is vital that we reflect accurate history and do not distort the reality of the experience of the people of Palestine, not just for one day or one week or one month, but for decades. And we need to be honest about that. It is most distressing when members of parliament ignore facts. This cannot be something that we tolerate. It is also untrue that South Africa has not criticized Hamas for its breach of international human rights law. It has. The president stated very clearly in concert with the Secretary General of the United Nations that the killing of civilians and taking of hostages is a violation of international human rights law. So we must be accurate in all our contributions. And I shall say more later. Thank you. Thank you. The Honorable Minister Gubai. The Honorable Thank you Minister very much. 
Thank you very much, House Chair. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Honorable Members. Um, let me appreciate the input by Honorable Member that spoke about the infrastructure development in our country, which is supported, um, as Minister Zigala has been rolling out, part of the work that is in support of the economic reconstruction and recovery plan. That is work that will continue to support communities where we ensure that urban and rural communities are aligned and therefore are able to assist and support for the economic development in our areas. So we appreciate this by member of ANC who has raised it and commend that and assuring our communities that as we continue with the implementation of the ERR and the infrastructure development, more communities will be supported and will see this program arriving to them. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Uh, the last one, the Honorable Deputy Minister Molloy. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, the point raised by Honorable Costi of the EFF earlier on, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, I, I must say that it is very sad and I don't think also it, it, it does, I don't think it warrants any response from 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 the ministry uh, because the Honourable Member uh, does participate uh, uh, in the Portfolio Committee of Employment and Labour and her concerns, all her concerns and fears uh, 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 are always addressed uh, there and there has never been at any given moment where we, uh, as the department, uh, refuses to give information uh, uh, to the Portfolio Committee or any member for that matter, uh, I, I don't think it does re uh, warrant any response of uh, an honorable uh, uh, House Chairperson. And I thank you. Thank you. Honorable members, that concludes ministerial responses. Honorable members, the fourth item on the order paper is the statement by the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation on the ongoing Israel-Palestine conflict. I will now recognize the Honorable the Minister. Oh, being a girl, turning on to The speaker is home. I'm trying to that's by team. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Chairperson, once more. I should have agreed with the Honorable Pumza that the African National Congress is not deterred by these polls that are always meant to frighten the African National Congress. We will campaign hard and we will do well. Honorable members and honorable chairperson, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present the statement. Today, I believe all of us joined the world in expressing horror at the war crimes being committed in Palestine through the targeting of civilians, civilian infrastructure, UN premises, and other vulnerable targets. These actions remind us of our experiences as black South Africans living under apartheid. This is one of the key reasons South Africans like people in cities all over the world have taken to the streets to express their anger and concern at what is taking place in Gaza and the West Bank. These demonstrations illustrate the frustration felt the world over that people are being attacked and are losing their lives with little or no action to stop these atrocities. The facts that have been released detailing the devastation of the current conflict are horrendous. Over a thousand Palestinians are dead, thousands injured, public facilities destroyed, and cruel and wanton bombardment is ongoing. Therefore, as South Africa, we remain steadfast in calling for an immediate comprehensive ceasefire. The full, as well as complete opening of all humanitarian corridors 
to ensure much needed aid and basic services reach those in need. Madam Chairperson, the actions that we are witnessing daily by Israel are a violation of international law, including the United Nations Charter, the Geneva Convention and all its protocols. In its attacks on and kidnapping of innocent civilians, Hamas has also violated international law. While we express horror at the violence, it is critical that we acknowledge that the illegal occupation of Palestine by Israel for several decades has led to bitter hatred and increased violence, and that this violence is not the first violence the people of Palestine have experienced. It has been going on for decades and decades and decades, and nothing we can say will obliterate that fact. However, Chairperson, the murder of children of women and the aged by Israel is an act that should have resulted in the International Criminal Court issuing an immediate arrest warrant for key decision makers, including Mr. Netanyahu, who is responsible for violations of international criminal law. Madam Chairperson and honorable members, it's important to stress that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can only be solved through the establishment of two states, Palestine and Israel, living side by side in peace. The Palestinian state should be created along the lines of the 1967 border with East Jerusalem as its capital and in line with standing multiple UN resolutions. For this two-state solution to materialize, a peace process initiated by the United Nations needs to commence urgently. We are aware that increasing settlements and illegal occupation have been used to make the creation of a Palestinian state almost impossible. The world must reject the Bantustan type balkanization that has increased bitterness and hatred. We must reinforce all efforts aimed at creating two states. Madam Chair and Honorable Members, the collective punishment that Israel is exacting on all Palestinian people is an affront that has gone on for too long. The world has expressed horror at these affronts, but has not acted effectively to save Palestinian lives. Sadly, even here in our own country, there are many who choose to turn a blind eye to these atrocities. On 27 October this year, our country was among more than two thirds of the member states of the United Nations that called for an immediate ceasefire in the General Assembly. This decision of the General Assembly has been ignored. It is impossible for us to continue to proclaim the importance of international law and the importance of the UN Charter for some situations and not for others, as if the rule of law only applies to a select few. For international law to be credible, it should be uniformly applied and not be selective. Let us be clear. Let's not talk a little bit about members. logistical issues. Um, Let uh, us be clear, me, honor, honorable, honorable members, members, Israel is an occupying power uh, confirmed by the America. International Court of the Website. Honorable. Everybody needs a visa. There are no honorable, honorable minister. Sorry about that. Uh, IT, could you please remove uh, long? This is the third time right. this honorable member has done this. Honorable, Honorable Papa. Just wanted to raise an issue which the previous presiding officer raised. Members who, when we are in the sitting, they are busy with other things. I think that issue is very serious, and it's not uh, it's not uh, a matter which uh, is you can laugh about, as uh, Doctor Ndozi is trying to do. It's a serious matter. 
And Thank it affects all the political parties, by the way. Thank you, Honourable Member. It's noted. You may proceed, Honourable Minister. Chairperson, it's important that we should be clear on, my, on facts. Israel is an occupying power. This was confirmed by the International Court of Justice, as well as the United Nations. As an occupying power, Israel can use tools applicable to the rule of law, including policing powers, to deal with criminal actions in the area it occupies. An occupying state cannot exercise control over territory it occupies and simultaneously attack that territory on the claim that it is foreign and poses an exogenous national security threat. The notion of Israel's right to defend itself through military means has been used erroneously in international law by many and deliberately by others to justify the unlawful use of force by Israel on the people of Palestine in Gaza and the West Bank. The crime of genocide sadly looms large in the current situation in Gaza. We recall that in 1994, a genocide occurred on the African continent with much of the whole world watching as innocent people were massacred. During the Second World War, innocent people were massacred and placed under siege. In response, at the end of the war, an international system was created, including the establishment of the United Nations. Human rights instruments and judicial mechanisms were also established so that history would not repeat such cruelty. However, the selective application of these international instruments and the utilization of some of the mechanisms for attaining narrow interests has resulted in calling to question the effectiveness of the system. It is a system that has failed the people of Gaza as it did in 1994 for the people of Rwanda and later of Bosnia. What is needed now more than ever before is reform of the system of global governance so that it is fair, equitable, and has the capacity to respond to the needs of all persons in situations of threat and harm. The system that is needed should not just be a tool for the most powerful countries of the world, but one that provides protection for the most vulnerable. The inadequacy of the UN Security Council, which we've pointed to many times, a council that has a mandate derived from the UN Charter for the maintenance of international peace and security, has become a glaring fault in the international system. The Security Council, due to aggravated politicization, has not at the very least been able to call for a humanitarian ceasefire to allow for much needed humanitarian supplies to go to those that need it most. This one once again illustrates the urgent need for the reform of this body. Chairperson, many of us feel helpless looking at the images of the suffering children and other innocent civilians as they are battered. As South Africans, we need to raise our voices and call for the following concrete actions to end the suffering. One, an immediate comprehensive ceasefire. Two, the opening of humanitarian corridors so that aid and other basic services reach all in need. Three, all parties to exercise restraint and to desist from fueling this patently unjust war and human suffering, including by seizing the supplying of weapons to the various parties. Four, the release of all civilian hostages. Five, in light of statements on the use of nuclear power, the establishment of a Middle East nuclear weapons free zone, just as we have created on our continent, Africa. Six, the resumption of a comprehensive dialogue led and owned by Palestinians and Israelis themselves and facilitated by the United Nations. And seven, the deployment of a UN rapid deployment force in Palestine mandated to monitor the implementation of a ceasefire, cessation of hostilities, and most importantly, to protect civilians. 
Chairperson, honorable members, our common humanity dictates that all human lives matter and the time for the international community to stand together and act is now. We who enjoy the freedom from apartheid can never, ever be the ones who agree to an apartheid form of oppression. And it is not merely ourselves who are saying this, it is international organizations that have done research on torture, imprisonment, killing, and who previously when reporting on other matters are regarded as credible, but when it comes to Israel, their reports are not accepted. This cannot be tolerated. This brutality should not be accepted. We must call for a ceasefire now as honorable members of the House of South Africa. I thank you, honorable chair. Thank you very much, honorable minister. The Honorable Powell. Thank you. Chairperson, the Democratic Alliance stands in solidarity with both Palestinians and Israelis who seek a two state solution. We embrace rationality based on peaceful coexistence for a secure Israel and a free Palestine. We seek the triumph of rational forces committed to peaceful coexistence on both sides of this terrible conflict. That is why we stand united in our condemnation of the brutality unleashed on the Israeli people by Hamas on the 7th of October. This massacre conjured some of the darkest memories of centuries of persecution against the Jewish people. We condemn in the strongest terms the dehumanization of any person on the basis of their faith, their race, their lineage, or their place of birth. But Hamas's actions on the 7th of October also betrayed the people of Gaza, unleashing a calamity that is unprecedented in living memory upon more than two million Palestinians. What is equally true is that the people of Palestine are not defined by Hamas. And the people of Palestine cannot and must not be subjected to collective punishment. That is why the DA condemns, in the strongest terms, Israeli radicals like Minister Eliyahu, who over the weekend threatened the use of nuclear weapons against the people of Palestine. Dangerous statements such as these are transparent dog whistles to escalation designed to perpetuate an already fractious climate of fear and terror, the disproportionate burden of which is borne by innocent civilians. The DA remains concerned by the escalation of violence and the rising death toll in both Gaza and on the West Bank. The intense human suffering and the scale of civilian casualties must be brought to urgent conclusion. We again call on Israel to ensure that defensive action is indeed carried out within the confines of international law. Both the indiscriminate killing of civilians through the use of carpet bombing and the vile use of civilians as human shields by terrorists must be condemned as acts of immorality committed by men who betray the foundational principles of the very faiths they claim to represent. The DA further calls for the creation of safe zones and for a humanitarian pause in the fighting to ensure the flow of increased aid into Gaza and to allow more civilians to access guaranteed safety. Importantly, as the fighting rages, we call on all peace-loving South Africans to recognize the deeper conflict playing out on both sides of this terrible war. This is not a war between the descendants of Ishmael and Isaac, but rather a war between radicalism, which seeks the annihilation of the other side, and rationality, which recognizes the inherent rights of both the Israelis and the Palestinians to statehood, sovereignty, and security. Fundamentalists on both sides of this conflict who have been stewing in a combustible combination of grievances for generations and who feed off of one another in order to ramp up and rationalize their own extremism must be rebuked by all of us. For peace to be possible, rationality rather than radicalism must win the day. 
Honourable members, history will remember the significance of this moment and how we either used our voices to fuel hatred and division or advocate for lasting peace. This crisis can only be brought to an end by those driven by peace building, reconciliation and possibility. The question that all of us in this house must today ask ourselves is how we can each be honest brokers of peace. Because despite the lessons imparted by the giants of our democracy, some amongst us today have already descended into the fog of war and are now entirely blinded by it. South Africa's history should serve as a beacon of hope, reminding the world that peace and reconciliation are possible even in the darkest of times. Instead, the governing ANC has altogether dismantled our nation's once respected international standing and exposed their inherent moral bankruptcy. The Honourable Minister Pundall cannot stand at this podium and position the ANC government as an honest advocate for peace. The truth is that the ANC seems to have no genuine interest in building peace in the Middle East. They are only interested in using this tragedy for their own political gain, hoping that they can sow division and distract the South African people from their dismal failure as our government. The minister's recent telephone call to the leader of Hamas squandered any last remaining vestige of credibility her department had left. The Honorable Minister's recent visit to Iran to meet President Raisi, who is actively funding Hamas and whose government has ordered the execution of more than 1,275 of their own citizens since August 2021, has exposed the ANC for the hypocrites that they are. As the prospect of electoral defeat looms ever closer, the ANC stands exposed before the world as the desperate political opportunists that they have now become. But South Africa is more than her government, and we, her people, can still raise our voices in support of fundamental moral propositions, that Israel has a right to exist and to protect her people, that the Palestinian people have a right to live in peace, free from occupation and the threat of unyielding retaliation for crimes perpetrated by terrorists. And that through a two-state solution, both Israel and Palestine can enjoy freedom and prosperity. With these aspirations as our guiding light, the international community must stand together to support restoring the security of Israel and ensuring the return of hostages, the urgent provision of adequate humanitarian aid to Gaza, the establishment of safe zones for displaced civilians, and an urgent humanitarian pause in the fighting to ensure the free flow of aid and to allow more civilians to reach these safe zones. World leaders need to urgently come together and start building the conditions for peace. Now is the time for leaders from across South Africa to unite on the basis of our shared constitutional values and call for peace. Drawing on the lessons of our nation's negotiated settlement in 1994 that averted war and built peace, we encourage all South African civil, religious, and political leaders to come together and to offer our mutual assistance in finding resolution to this abhorrent crisis and mapping a pathway to lasting peace in the region. Peace is possible, but we must have the moral fortitude to stand with those who pursue it and to condemn all of those who seek to destroy it. I thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Honorable Member. A complete distortion of what is happening in Gaza. The Honorable Tanlose. Thank you, uh, House Chaperson. We're here to stand with Palestine. We're here to take sides in favor of the oppressed. Condemn Israel and declare that it is a murderous apartheid regime engaged in systematic extermination of Palestinians. It is not a single event. They are engaged in a system permanently subjecting Palestinians to racial humiliation. We do this because we understand that our freedom here was attained through massive international solidarity by peoples of the world, 90% of which had never set foot here. It is in this context that we are responding to the suffering of a people who live thousands of kilometers from South Africa. We know that we are international citizens. As we stand here, Israel has massacred over 10,000 Palestinians in Gaza under their military assault, killing children, bombing churches, hospitals, schools. Many have been painting Palestinians who are responding over 
half a century to Israeli systematic oppression as terrorists. Now, the label of terrorists, we know it very well because it is a label that was put to Mandela. It is a label that was given to Subukwe. It is a label that was given to the, to the liberation movement. The Israeli state was formed in 48 with the full support of Western powers through forced removals and ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. Fact, it was inaugurated as a Jewish only state where Palestinians who have the right to the land are not returned or are not allowed to return. Yet any Jewish person who has not born there, who has never been there, can go and attain citizenship with immediate effect. They control movements of people through thousands of military checkpoints. In fact, they have built a wall and a fence around Gaza controlling entry and exit of people and goods. There are separate roads for Palestinians and Jewish people around many Jewish settlements in Palestine. Palestinians do not enjoy freedom to demonstrate against their oppressor. They are told demonstrations, they, are, they get arrested, they even get killed. Thousands of Palestinians are arrested without trial, even charged in Israeli military courts. The world knows this. And when Palestinians respond, they are called terrorists. The Israeli state is fundamentally a racist state. Nobody must be allowed to coexist with a fundamentally racist state. Who can't, who can't be asked in the interest of the values of our constitution to recognize a racist state whose establishment is for a Jewish only people at the expense of Palestinians. Why would you do that? Those are the facts. This is not a religious war, Murud. It's an evil war. It's not a holy war. There is no people who have a God's right to be superior to anyone. The Israelis don't represent the Jewish communities of the world. They represent Zionism and racism. It must be said here, whoever supports them supports racism. So, what is South Africa doing in a relationship with a racist regime? If they are engaged in a genocidal exercise, Minister Naledi Pando, why are you recalling people for consultation? Because you've already declared that there is a genocide. Why are we friends with people who are violating the values of our constitution? Why are we friends with people who are massacring children in hospitals, in schools? What must happen? What must be said before the whole world isolates Israel? Israelis, Palestinians for the longest time never asked you for a single bullet, which they should because they've got the right to fight even with military arms against the racist regime. They've asked you for a simple thing. Isolate Israel the way the world isolated apartheid. When are you doing that? Let's sever ties because a relationship with Israel as South African offends our constitutional values. It offends any rational thinking about coexistence. It offends peace. We should recall the ambassadors, everybody. We should fire the ambassador of Israel. We can't be friends with Israel until they establish a society in compliance with international law on one hand, and they recognize the right of Palestinians to coexist. I wish, I wish for once in our lives, we can be on the right side of history. On Let's Robert sever Dazi. all ties with the race. Thank you very much. Thank you. The good doctor. The Honorable Sangwa. Thank you very much, House Chairperson. Honorable Minister, I think of the seven action steps that you have enumerated in your statement, none of them can be faulted. The Ngata Freedom Party has always advocated for the path of nonviolence and negotiation and remains steadfast in our belief that a two-state solution for Israel and Palestine could provide the peace, justice, and stability that the Middle East so desperately needs. Exactly a month ago, on October 7, the fragile peace in the Middle East was tested and shattered when a series of Hamas attacks were carried out against Israel, with civilians bearing the brutal brunt of this violence. 
as the Israel and Palestine conflict continues to inflict suffering on innocent civilians and disrupt regional harmony, the IFP strongly urges all parties involved to lay down their arms and engage in meaningful dialogue to find a lasting solution to this protracted crisis. We call on Israel to exercise restraint and commit to a ceasefire and a peace process. We call on Hamas to join the peace process and come to the negotiation table in finding an amicable solution to this conflict. Now, after weeks of violence, many more innocent lives have been lost. These are not faceless statistics, but real people with hopes and aspirations, families and communities. It is our moral duty, not only as South Africans, but as a global community to hear their cries and respond to their plight. Further, the IF, as the IFP, we want to caution the South African government that isolationism in a time of war is not a solution. Recalling or dismissing ambassadors merely amounts to regressive diplomacy, which in turn complicates the negotiations. If South Africa is truly to be a trusted mediator, committed to reaching a negotiated peace, all parties to the conflict must be treated in the same way. As the IFP, we echo the call of the United Nations for both sides to declare an immediate ceasefire and to return to the negotiating table. The nations of the world must stand together to condemn all violence against civilians, regardless of their circumstances. The international community, including the United Nations, must facilitate and support these negotiations, ensuring that they are fair, inclusive, and conducted in good faith. Chairperson, we want to reiterate that we remain committed to a two-state solution whereby both nations can peacefully coexist. Achieving this solution will require both sides to make concessions for the greater good. It is therefore incumbent on all of us to be part of the solution and not to contribute to the problem. Honorable Chairperson, security is a fundamental concern quite clearly for both Israelis and Palestinians. Therefore, by advocating for an immediate cessation of hostilities, condemning the violence, and pushing strongly for a two-state solution, we are also advocating for the safety and security of those living in the region. Further, we want to reiterate the call and need to ensure that humanitarian aid reaches the people who so direly need them during this difficult time. But at the forefront of our thinking house chairperson is a clarion call for peace and negotiation. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Tangwa. The Honorable Dr. Melda. Thank you, Honorable. Can we just get... Okay, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Today is the 7th of November. It was exactly a month ago, on the 7th of October, when a group of Hamas fighters, some call them terrorists, some will call them freedom fighters, attacked civilians in the southern part of Israel. And the worst atrocities thinkable were perpetrated by this group of people. 1,400 Israeli citizens, civilians murdered, maimed, raped, children beheaded, put in ovens and set alight. That happened. That happened. The ANC, the ANC, how did the ANC respond? The ANC, the whole cabinet, came out with their scarves and they said, we support and we stand with Palestine. They said they support and stand with Palestine with the flags and everything in your hands. Not one word, not one word of condemnation of Hamas and these atrocities. Not one word. Only after, after Ahmed Abbas denounced Hamas, after that, a weak sentence came, oh, the, the record is there and the minister knows that. A weak record came from the ANC. The minister today was more than normally a responsible minister with good proposals, creating an impression that the ANC is sincere in this whole process. No, you're not. While the Honorable Dr. Ndlozi was speaking and making an attack on Israel with all those statements, this side of the house, the ANC, we're all nodding in support. All of you, look at that. Yes, 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 yes. There you go. There you go. That is the real ANC. 
That is the real ANC, not the not the position to, to, taken by the minister today. What was the relationship in Gaza? What was the relationship between Gaza and Israel before the 7th of October? What was the relationship? Every day, every day, 20,000 people from Gaza went into Israel to voluntary work. There was a good relationship. Every day, hundreds of trucks, every day, hundreds of trucks went into Gaza to take goods and to bring exports from Gaza back. That was the relationship. But then Hamas decided to destroy all of that. Now, the minister, you have now, you have now recalled our ambassadorial staff in Israel. And you said it's for consultation purposes. It's not for consultation. No, you can take the telephone and consult. You can take a Zoom call and consult. You've drew, drew those people. Why? To send a message to Israel and to send a message to your supporters as well. But you know what? Your message reached further. Today, two senators in the U.S., Senator Chris Coons and Senator Jim Risch, reacted to that state of yours. The fact that you are with Russia, the fact that you are with Hamas, the fact with, that you are with uh, uh, Iran, you went there. Today, they've reacted by saying the Ahua process, they will have to take a course of corrective action in Congress. That's the reality. That's, you say it's okay. You say it's okay. Now, Honorable Minister, unfortunately, I don't have the time to, to discuss all these things with you. I've got four minutes. But let me conclude. I have reason to believe that you've got good contacts with Hamas and you've got good contacts with Iran. Oh, yes, you do. Now, let me tell order, you, order, me honorable tell members, you, the conflict can allow stop. Allow the speaker to conclude. The conflict can stop today. Today, three conditions, three of them. The missiles fired from Gaza must stop. The, the missiles must stop. Secondly, all hostages must be released immediately. Thirdly, the perpetrators of these atrocities by Hamas must be banished. I hope the minister listens. I hope you will convey this. I'm telling you, there are three. You don't listen to me. You don't listen to me. You don't have to listen to me. The ANC is on the wrong side of history, and that's why you will be rejected. Thank you very much, Honorable Dr. Melda. Why to the ANC? Order, order, honorable members. Order, honorable members, the honorable three. Honorable House Chairperson, the ACGP asserts that South Africa has a moral oblig obligation to support a negotiated solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and to distance itself from a radicalized position on Israel a position which undermines any hope of a negotiated process and a peaceful outcome. The ACDP believes that the recalling of South Africa's diplomats in Israel will not serve any benefit to the Palestinian people. It simply removes South Africa's ability and authority to play a mediated role in any future peace negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. By recalling our diplomats, we have lost that role. This was affirmed by conflict resolution expert, Dr. Kingsley Makubela, who said the move was incorrect as the absence of a South African diplomatic mission in Tel Aviv will not change the situation and will not allow South Africa an understanding, a better understanding of what's happening here. Cabinet's decision to recall our Israeli diplomats is based on the assertion that the Israeli government failed to respect international law. The ACDP notes and appreciates the breaking of the silence in condemning and flouting international law by Hamas when they raped women, murdered and burnt children and whole families and kidnapped over 200 hostages, including minister, two South African women. And there was silence from South African government on that. Likewise, we cannot remain silent at the slaughter of thousands of ethnic Africans at the hands of the Arab Janjaweed calling dark-skinned Africans unbai slaves. We cannot be silent. 
Israel's history with its land goes back some 4,100 years. And some 3,400 years ago, Israel was established as a nation. Fact, Christianity was established 2,000 years ago and Islam about 1,400 years ago. It is a fact that Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005 and is not an occupier. Hamas is. The current com conflict can be found in the opening paragraph of Hamas's covenant. Israel will exist and continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it just as it obliterated others. Article 7 of Hamas says the day of judgment would not come until Muslims fight and kill Jews. This is not a call for peace, but a call for genocide. More chilling are Hamas's chants. First, the people of the Saturday Jews, and then the people of the Sunday Christians. The ACDP takes no pleasure in the death of the innocents and calls on both sides of this war to come together Thank you, in the international honorable member. community to bring all to the peace the time of is up. the table of peace. I thank you. The Honorable Kwankwa. Order, Honorable Members. Thank you, very, thank you very much, House Chair. The United Democratic Movement supports the Minister's call for an immediate cessation of host, all hostilities mm -hmm between Israel and Palestine in order to create an environment that is conducive for dialogue to occur. The fact is the ongoing Israel-Palestine conflict, which began in the mid 20th century, is one of the world's longest continuing conflict. And the international community must bear part of the blame and responsibility for allowing this con conflict to continue for as long as it has, and allowing and accepting the longest occupation in modern history. The conflict is characterized, as we know now and we have seen, by war crimes, from the intentional attacks on innocent women and children, innocent civilians, collective punishment of innocent people for the actions of Hamas. The racist world, unfortunately, which made the loudest noise during when in the war against uh, between Russia and Ukraine, has conveniently and decided to turn a blind eye to the merciless matter of women and children who are innocent simply because they are different color. As democratic countries around the world, we have failed the brutalized civilians in, Ghana, in Gaza. People are, are denied the most basic needs such as food, water, and health services, while you so-called Democrats and human rights activists decide to convenient turn a blind eye to what we consider to be a serious human rights violation of human rights. In the face of the murder of Palestinians, in fact, the Palestinian, Palestinians will, in the end, borrowing the words of Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, will not remember the words of their enemies, but the silence of their friends. Throughout history, women and children have consistently borne the brunt of the consequences of war, suffering long-term hardships. Israel's war in Gaza exemplifies this tragic re reality as it continues to take a heavy toll on the lives of women and children with each passing day. We have said, while this occurs, the, U the UN Security Council continues to and to bicker about insignificant issues while people are losing lives. We are calling not only on the South African government, but would like mm -hmm. to make a clarion call to continental leaders to do exactly what they did in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine maybe try to initiate its own independent mediation effort because the United States is discredited as a mediator. They can't be arming Israel and giving aid to Israel and then pretend and parade on TV as if they are trying to actually call for an immediate ceasefire, which is unadulterated claptrap. They think we're stupid. They are saying fight on the one hand and on the other. They are parading in front of cameras, posturing for the public, saying we're negotiating for a ceasefire and whatever they want to call it. In actual fact, they are supporting war because they are benefiting in their industry to war. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The Honorable Zongola. ATM. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. This debate is of paramount importance to our nation's values, its commitment to justice, its legacy as a beacon of hope for those oppressed and seeking freedom. First and foremost, the 
claim condemns the continuous violation of human rights in the Israeli-Palestine conflict. It is a humanitarian crisis that demands our collective outrage and immediate attention. We cannot remain silent whilst innocent civilians, including the most vulnerable women and children, suffer the devastating consequences of this protracted conflict. We as a nation must uphold the principles of justice, human dignity, self-determination for all peoples, including Palestinian people. We express our full support for the South African government decision to recall all South African diplomats from Israel. This is a crucial step that signifies our nation's commitment to the principles of justice and human rights. We, st we must stand in solidarity with the Pal Palestinian people, just as the world once stood with us during our own struggle against apartheid. Our history serves as a stark reminder of the value of the global support in the face of oppression and injustice. Furthermore, we strongly condemn the actions of the Israel's ambassadors to South Africa. Diplomacy should be conducted in a manner that is consistent with international law and, and principles of mutual respect. When such actions undermine these principles, they demand our swift and resolute response. In our fight against apartheid, we learned the profound significance of international solidarity and support. We cannot remain silent when faced with a gross violation of human rights. The parallels between our own painful history and the Israel-Palestine conflict are undeniable. That is why, as the ATM, in solidarity with the Palestinian people, calls for the Israel embassy embassy in South Africa to be shut down and the ambassador declared a personal grata as a powerful symbol of our protest against apartheid and genocide. We must take all necessary precautions to ensure that South Africa is not complicit in these grave human rights violations. Our nation's dedication to human rights should be unwavering and we must strive to set an example for the world by defending these fundamental principles. In conclusion, we align ourselves with the Minister of International Relations and we call for unwavering commitment to justice, peace, and the protection of human rights in the Israel-Palestine conflict. Let us be a voice of the voiceless and work diligently to, towards a future where both Israelis and Palestinians can coexist in peace and security. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The Honorable Heron. Thank you, House Chair. House Chair, in a dynamic and complex world of shifting geopolitical power, South Africa's foreign policy must be guided by the same constitutional values and principles that guide policy at home. On that basis, we cannot look the other way when Russia invades a neighboring for foreign a sovereign state, nor when Israel perpetrates genocide against the people of Palestine. We can't maintain friendly relations with a state that has publicly committed itself to perpetrating unprecedented violence against innocent people to, to buttress unjust policies that trigger me memories of our own experiences under apartheid. A state that is holding millions of people collectively responsible for Hamas's 7th of October attack despite the overwhelming majority of them having nothing to do with Hamas. We can't look the other way when images of dead and wounded Palestinian children dominate our screens and consciousness. As such, we regard the further review of diplomatic relations with Israel as necessary and appropriate and, and, as, and as a matter of principle. We further call on Durko to take up, to, to, to turn up the heat at the United Nations for a resolution calling for ceasefire. It's the right thing to do. This doesn't mean we're anti-Semitic, pro-Hamas, or don't believe that the people of Israel have the same right as the people of any other nation to live in safety. To be clear, for as long as Israel illegally occupies Palestinian land, encourages its farmers to grab more land, and regards Palestinians as untrustworthy and deserving of contempt, it breathes fresh ox oxygen on a smoldering fire. It provides fresh daily provocation for people who are willing to do what Hamas did four Saturdays ago. Palestinians have a generational duty to struggle for their freedom from occupation and contempt. Their actions, however, must comply with acceptable international practices, with respect 
to the protection of civilian lives. Neither the extremist leaders in Palestine and, and Israel, nor their backers across the region and the Atlantic, own solutions to the crisis. There aren't any military solutions. Real solutions belong to ordinary citizens and civil society. The people of Israel and Palestine must stand up against violence and hate and elect leaders willing to engage in meaningful dialogue to develop an environment in which Jews and Muslims can live in peace, be it in two separate states or a single human community. In the meantime, the only short-term solution is an immediate and unconditional ceasefire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The Honorable Sheikh Imam. Thank you, Honorable House Chairperson. Let me start off by saying my colleagues here, either they have gone deaf or they are gone blind. I hear some of them saying we must go and negotiate. Isn't that what was happening for all these years and Israel has not complied with one single agreement? So now you still say you must go negotiate. And what you're asking them to go and negotiate? Or with the, you want to negotiate with the Palestinians on something that rightfully belongs to the Palestinians. And why are you forgetting that Israel never existed? The Palestinian Jews, Christians and Muslims have lived there peacefully side by side for thousands of years. It's Zionism that's only a hundred some odd years old. That is what the problem is. And I'm not surprised by your freedom front. I cannot be surprised because you and the Zionist state of Israel are no different. That is exactly what you did to ordinary South Africans during the days of apartheid. So let when you talk about wanting to have a settlement and agreement. Now, I see you raising a question about there was peace in the middle, in the, particularly in Gaza. Where do you get your facts from every other day? Palestinians have been massacred in, in Palestine. And you don't see that. Suddenly you see 200 hostages and suddenly you are rising. Your temperatures have gone very high. To the DA, let me turn on and say to you, stop living a lie. You go back and search your conscience. What is the truth about Palestine? Go and do that. You get funding from the Zionist state. That's why you have to come here and sing their praises. That is exactly what you are doing to you. Your survival depends on that. That is the problem to, to you. To the IFP, I want to say, what dialogue can you talk about? What about the agreements that were entered into? Tell me so many. They have not complied. Israel has not complied with one single agreement. You heard the statement by the minister in Israel. What did he say? Go and throw an atomic bomb there, a nuclear bomb. That is what he says. Now, are you telling me is that conducive environment for negotiation? No. We are saying there's only one way. Expel the Israeli ambassador once and for all and shut the embassy in South Africa. Shut the, shut the embassy, the liaison office in Israel. Shut it down. It's the only way they're going to learn. <clears throat> you said that during apartheid, but we got it. <laughs> Chairperson, Minister, visa conditions must be stringent for Israelis wanting to visit South Africa. On the issue of dual citizenship, we need to have a re-look at it because you cannot be using dual citizenship to go and participate in that military and commit atrocities. And remember, it's a serious threat to South Africa as well. The monies that are coming into this country to fund the Zionist political parties, yeah, we need to deal with that as well. And until you stop the funding that's coming, these people, remember, they are led by the United States, the big boss. This is what Thank it's you all much. about. Your time is up. So we need to take the stringent action that we need to take it now. But lastly, I want to say, if you are silent, you are Thank supporting you, Honourable genocide. Say, the time is silent up. Silent means supporting genocide. And today, Honourable Sheikh, the time is religion. up. Religion won't work anymore. Honourable Sheikh, the time is up. Order, order, honourable members. Uh, as the tempers are flying, please let's consider time. The Honourable Chapter. Thank you, Honourable Chair. When the South African government downgraded its Israel, its Israel embassy 
we hopefully we we were hopeful that the Israel embassy in South Africa will be permanently closed. We note that the onslaught against the innocent civilians of Palestine has been justified by the South African Jewish of des de deputies. We condemn this justification with the contempt it deserves. We also have not healed from the utterances sponsored by the then CRL Commissioner, Ms. Tokom Kwanaz Kaluva, who had argued that the downgrading of the Israel embassy was said to unfairly impact on the ability of South African Jews to practice and identify with their religion and cultural heritage. This line of reasoning was short-sighted as one could not elevate some huge cultural rights over human rights. Honorable Chair, we believe that there is a greater discourse to be had with the South African Zionist Federation, particularly to condemn Israel's crude destruction of human life. We also believe that a dialogue must be had with South African Union of Jewish Students and Benin Akiva, South Africa. We must foster a common understanding of human rights. Moreover, and most importantly, we call on a national boycott of the following brands. The Volvo Group, which allegedly supplies equipment used to bulldoze Palestinian homes. Protector and Gamble, which produces pampas. Motorola, which is allegedly provides surveillance equipment sealed to round Palestinian settlement. And McDonald's accused of unfairly discriminating against Arabic workers at their restaurants. Honorable Chair, we cannot allow apartheid Israel to hound the innocent people of Palestine. We therefore demand that the Israel embassy here in South Africa be downgraded with immediate effect. Our freedom is not complete without the freedom of the people of Palestine. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chapter. The Honorable Lord. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. The horrible war between Hamas and Israel is full of such intense hatred between, between them that neither an end game nor any path to a lasting solution is in sight. I hate to say the word, at least, although we know that 1,400 Israelis and more than 10,000 people in Gaza have been killed. Many of these are women and children. War crimes have been committed on both sides. The deliberate and discriminate targeting of civilians on either side reflects depriving of the worst kind. Hamas fired thousands of rockets to Israeli towns and attacked and killed civilians, including children, women, and old people. It also kidnapped hundreds of people. The Israeli military has flattened big parts of Gaza with airstrikes, blocked deliveries of food, water, fuel, and electricity. The 56 years of military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza 16 years of air, land, and sea blockade on the Gaza Strip. Israeli right-wingers willfully destroying Arab homes in the West Bank and causing continuous provocation at the al qasim Mosque. And Netanyahu in February 2023 signaling clearly that it was extremely unlikely that Israel and Palestinians will make any measurable progress towards a long-term peace anytime soon, provides the context to this war. While Hamas has, has to be stopped, the humanization of Palestinians has also to be stopped. Right-wing Israeli Defense Minister Yuv Galant recently referred to the more than 2,000 million inhabitants of the Gaza Strip as, and I quote, human animals when justifying a complete tightening of the siege on the street. While the world looks 
at while the world looks to engage the parties for a solution where no viable solution is available, a ceasefire must occur and humanitarian issues must receive the highest priority. Further, military actions will solve nothing but aggravate the situation even more. The madness must stop. The United Nations must step up to the plate and must do so quickly. And I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The Honorable Nyonso, the PAC. The Honorable Hendricks. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Honorable Chair, the resistance in Gaza will not stop. The Arab ambassadors in South Africa has come up with what they label a reasonable call. A must should release all the Israeli hostages on condition that Israel immediately causes the war in Gaza and withdraws from Gaza entirely. There is also a call that the resistance continue its firepower and use to ah and calling on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to support them to defeat Israel. Al Jama is torn between these two positions. But let me applaud the Ma Naledi Pando. Al Jama stands with you. And let me applaud President Ramaphosa, who wants the arms sales of South Africa to Israel to stop. Last year it was 30 billion rand. And the white rule led by Honorable Stian Eisen, such calls will not be made in the South African Parliament in 2024. The DIS are hoped to rule. Israel may not be a state. It is a people. al Jamaa condemns the Zionist groups, uh, 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 especially the Jewish Board of Deputies, for heaping insults on the minister and for disparaging our office. This is treasonous behavior and the Minister of Justice must act. It is now time to enforce the legal provisions of the Foreign Military Assistance Act by prosecuting South African citizens taking part in the genocide in Gaza and serving in Israel's army of fascists, barbarians, and the worst of mankind. Also, to be prosecuted are those engaged in the alleged recruitment and development of South African citizens. Occupying powers do not have a right to defend themselves. Occupied people can shoot rockets. The Al-Aqsa flood has opened the eye of everyone globally that the real enemy of humanity is the triumvirate of the West, the USA's Biden, UK Sanak, and Francis Macron. They've contributed arms to the Zionist state that has been responsible for endly, endless atrocities in the Palestinian areas. The Israel people are their puppets. al Jamaa thanks Minister Lairi Panda for unwavering support for Palestine freedom struggle and for the decision to recall South African's diplomatic staff from Tel Aviv. al Jamaa calls for an immediate unconditional ceasefire. Thank you very much, Honorable House Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Andrex. The Honorable Mahoma Pelo. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. I also take this opportunity to greet the collective of Honorable Members esteem ears and eyes of the people of South Africa and elsewhere. I thought, Chairperson, that uh, we need to start by just doing a succinct characterization of the state of Israel. It is a consequence of war. It lives and survives on war. It's a settler, heartless, apartheid, immoral, genocidal, vampire state. The only political relevance of its Prime Minister Netanyahu is war. It perpetually quenches its thirst for war through the blood of the Palestinian people. Like a vampire, 
Its primary prey is the people of Palestine. It respects no rules of international governance. It has no ear to listen to Israeli voices that say, not in our name. It has no brain to comprehend truth that no force can defeat a just cause of the people. The genesis of its stupendous superiority is parented by the UK and the US at all. It lacks the necessary political consciousness to realize the danger it poses to a correct proposal for the two states solution. It has no ear and emotions to listen to the painful voices of dying children of Palestine. It has no comprehension that perpetual genocidal maiming, suffocation, and annihilation of Palestinians will be met with perpetual protracted just struggle by the Palestinians to liberate themselves. Let's just deal with some of the distortions. The war in Palestine did not start on the 7th of October, 2023. And the subsequent propagandist tirade of the so-called right to self-defense by the state of Israel. We do not condone violence, but a question might be posed. What right of self-defense do you have when you arrive in a place of not your own, take what does not belong to you by force, and any inquiry or resistance to your immoral, illegal, insane act is met with declaration of death of innocent people. Among the main ones laws that the Palestinian people had to face is in 1917, 1918, when the British used force to colonize Palestine under command of General Allen Bay. The British notoriety in 1820 was extended to South Africa upon their arrival here in Cape Town, in Table Bay. By fire by force, State of Israel was declared in 1948, the same year when the National Party was formed and immediately started apartheid system here in South Africa. As we speak, honorable members, indications are that more than 10,000 Palestinian people have been killed in 30 days. More than 70% of these people who are maimed are women, the elderly, the disabled, the sick, and, ch and children. What is the scene of the Palestinians? The only scene is to say that they must have their land without occupation. The genocidal apartheid state of Israel expects the Palestinian people to allow them to annex more and more land, restrict their movement, suppress their human rights, rob and deny them of their dignity without any form of resistance. Because of time, I will not state the number of UN resolutions that the state of Israel has defied from 1947 to the recent history. They also defied the two agreements that were made in Oslo once they had participated in that particular process. Let's talk about uh, our, our friends on the left here, honorable members who are a collective of the moonshotists. Your hypocrisy is exposed because I characterize you as political pendulumists. Conveniently, you've forgotten that you call the ANC and its leader, President Nelson Mandela, a terrorist. You will not tell your friends in the apartheid state of Israel that today you will live side by side in relative peace with the people you call terrorists, monkeys, subhumans, people you maimed, killed, throttled, took their land, their animals, they are being and completely dehumanize us as black people. Stian Hazen, I want to challenge you and your friends, Honorable Stian Hazen, 
as much as you were populist and went to Ukraine, I challenge you to get into a flight and go to Gaza. Tell your Prime Minister Netanyahu on how the ANC and other progressive formations liberated you, your ancestors, despite the fact that as blacks we are sub subjects of apartheid, colonial subjugation. Try and draw Prime Minister Netanyahu's attention to the reality and the truth that the collective apartheid onslaught of 342 years on black people in South Africa was resolved through peaceful negotiated settlement. Advise him that as a country, we rank among the best ex examples on political conflict resolution and working through the United Nations, we stand by as South Africa to assist. Please tell him that we declare this the ANC in the Freedom Charter, that all national groups shall have equal rights. And as we speak here today, all national groups have got equal rights. He might listen to you because you are birds of the same feathers. Today, today you seek to separate Nelson Mandela from the ANC and you have not succeeded. Now let me come to you on a honorable measure of the ACDP. And I want to quote Deuteronomy. It says, foreigners who live in your land will gradually gain more and more power while you gradually lose yours. And this is what the apartheid state of Israel is doing to the Palestinian people. You will never comment and thank the people of Palestine and the ANC for advocating a two-state solution with Israel and Palestine living side by side in peace. You will never say this truth, you honorable members on the left. Some of you are offsprings and permanent beneficiaries of the apartheid colonial brutality, whose consequence today is painfully reflected in a white minority of only 7%, controlling and owning more than 90% of South Africa's economy. You say you respect human rights, but you will not tell you as backed Prime Minister Netanyahu that it is inhumane and genocidal to announce on TV that you on TV that you will deny innocent people access to water, fuel, food, medication, free movement, prayer. You will destroy their hospitals, ambulances, schools, places of worship, and so on and so on. On way forward. We suggest that the United Nations-led immediate peace initiative must be implemented. Two, the UN must decisively act against the state of Israel. And as the minister has said, the ICC must charge Prime Minister Netanyahu. Three, the UN must enforce its own resolutions that have been defied by Israel. Four, we applaud the president for recalling the ambassador, but in addition, will suggest that the ambassador of Israel must go home until a negotiated process has been started in Gaza and Palestine. South Africans who are in the Israeli Defense Force must be brought back, named, and action must be taken against them. As Yasser Arafat said, and I quote, the victory march will continue until the Palestinian flag flies in Jerusalem and all Palestine, Galebo. Thank you very much, Honorable Mahoma Pelo. Yes, so we. The Honorable, the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation. Honorable Chairperson, I thank all members for participating in the debate that followed my statement, even those I disagree with. Honorable Chairperson, I was taught when I was very young that insults are the last refuge of a scoundrel. And so calling me a terrorist, friend of Hamas, etc., is like water off a duck's back because it's an absolute untruth 
and is a mere insult of a scoundrel who has run out of ideals. It has been clear in all our contributions that we support a two-state solution. This means we believe Israel has the right to exist as a state alongside a state of Palestine. This has been the long-standing view of the African National Congress before anyone expressed a view on Palestine. And so don't come here and attempt to claim any knowledge. The rights of Palestinian people are infringed on a daily basis. The Honorable Lekota was reported in a Jerusalem newspaper as saying there is no apartheid in Israel. People ride on buses together. He forgot to say that Palestinians are forced to live in small enclaves. They are not allowed to own their own property. Their land can be seized without any compensation. And they have to carry identity documents, go through a range of points where their identity is constantly checked. In some, they exist in an apartheid state. So, chairperson attempts to cast aspersions will not cause us to fail to speak for the oppressed wherever they may be. The atrocities we've reported upon in this debate are real and they're acknowledged by millions. The fake news of baby beheadings have been tried by the greatest in world power and have been proven to be false social media reports. And for such to be reported in this house as though it is factual is absolutely disgusting lies. The bombing of hospitals, which was denied, has been proven to be real. Hello, Minister. Thank you. Please take your seat. There's a point of order. Request Thank that. you, Honorable Chairperson. Is the Honorable Minister prepared to take a question? You can take your seat, Honorable Minister. Honorable Dr. Melda. I've asked, is the Honorable Minister prepared to take a question? Honorable Minister, are you prepared to take a question from the Honorable Melda? The Honorable Member can pose it. Hello? Did I, did, did I hear you correctly saying that the atrocities that we are speaking about, the beheading of children, that those are fake news, that it's not true? Is that the position of the South African government? I want to ask you now. Yeah. No, it is evidence that has been provided by a range of non-governmental organizations, both in Israel and Palestine, because we don't only speak to Palestinians, we speak to peace-loving Israelis as well. And we know that there's a lot of fake news that attempts to cast Palestinians in a bad light. And it has been admitted, even from the White House spokesperson, that that statement that was made at the highest level was actually proven not to be factual. So, Honorable Member, I've responded to your question. And it's important, as I said at the start of my contribution, that when we speak on these matters, let us speak being honest and factual. The facts are the people of Palestine are denied the right to exist as human beings. They are denied the right to enjoy the freedoms and the rights we so love as South Africans, the rights and freedoms we fought so hard for, the rights and freedoms we united on as a diverse South African people. Today, some of us in this house belong, be, believe these rights belong to some and not to others. That is not the South African way. We believe all human beings enjoy the right to exist in freedom, enjoying justice and humanity. And that is the message that has to come out of this house. This house cannot stand up for abuse, cannot stand up for the infringement of other human beings, no matter who those human beings are. We've never sought retribution. I have the story of my grandfather died of a broken heart. He was a tailor. 
and he had worked very hard, his fingers down to the skin, to make enough money to buy a house in Durban. And they got that house, my grandfather and my grandmother. Two years after they got it, the area was declared a white area. They lost that house without compensation. And he essentially died of a broken heart. I have no retribution. Because today, I'm part of seeking to build a better South Africa. And our role must be to seek to build a better world. That that benefit we enjoy of human rights, of a fantastic constitution, of having institutions that are democratic and work for all of us. That privilege is not just for us. It must be for everyone. And in any debate we have, if we are true to ourselves, if we are true to our history, if we are true to what we've achieved, we will stand up and say, what is being done to the people of Palestine is wrong, is intolerable, and we will not pretend to accept it. I thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Honorable members, that concludes party responses to the statement. The Secretary will read the first order. Consideration of budgetary review and recommendation report of Portfolio Committee on Health on Performance of National Department of Health and Entities 2022-2023. Thank you. And I now recognize the Honorable the Chief Whip of the Majority Party. Thank you very much, House Chair. House Chair, I move that uh, the report be adopted by this House. Thank you. Requests for declarations of votes have been received in line with the motion adopted by the House on the 31st of October 2023. I will now allow for up to two minutes one member of each political party wishing to make a declaration an opportunity to do so. The DA. House Chair, the public health sector is in severe crisis and in need of a major turnaround strategy. There is no indication that the National Department of Health has any tenacity in achieving fiscal stability through controlled government expenditure and debt reduction. Just look at the medico-legal claims of 77 billion rand under the department and expenditure that was returned in the financial year of nearly 1.7 billion rand. At this stage, the public health system is on life support and there is no political will to fix it. Instead, the ANC government is touting the NHI, which is totally unachievable in this economic climate. This ANC government speaks about protecting vulnerable South Africans, but the decline of the health system year on year is dismal. The lack of sufficient management of funding and resources has resulted in an overburdened system that struggles to meet the basic healthcare needs of citizens. This is further exacerbated by the growing population and the burden of infectious diseases, including HIV and AIDS and TB. There are severe shortages of healthcare professionals, understaffing that leads to long waiting times, reduced quality of care, and exhaustion of healthcare workers. In addition, healthcare infrastructure is in disrepair. Many public hospitals and clinics lack essential equipment and facilities, making it impossible to provide adequate care, compromising the health and safety of patients and demoralizing workers. Corruption and mismanagement are plaguing the public health care sector, diverting funds and resources away from where they are most needed. This not only undermines the system, but erodes public trust in the ANC government's ability to provide essential services. The NHI is not the answer. The ANC government must address Thank systemic much, challenges Honourable and Member. allocate resources accordingly. The time to act is now. After the 2024 elections, the DA will ensure that that happens. I thank you. 
EFF. IFP Thank you honorable house chairperson corruption crumbling infrastructure patient neglect equipment failure theft Organizational chaos and staff work overload have become synonymous with our country's public health care system. The expected decrease in the health budget raises even more concerns as we can foresee that it will only exacerbate the challenges that are already weighing down on quality health care. While we understand that the implementation of fiscal consolidation measures to reduce spending and manage debt is the government attempt at finding a solution to the enormous financial crisis facing our public health care. We have to lament once again the fact that we cannot continuously be a country stuck in a reactive cycle of implementing desperate solutions. Our government and specifically the Department of Health should have paid close attention to the management of our public hospitals and clinics. The Auditor General have reported to us that across provinces material misstatements in the financial report and the overall quality of these reports have been an issue that requires correction on an annual basis. The sheer apathy displayed by the provincial departments of health for the implementation of the AG's recommendation is simply unacceptable. Considering this, it does not come as a surprise that medical legal claims are consuming the health sector, totaling approximately 67 billion. Therefore, the IFP would like to emphasize both the AG and the portfolio committee recommendation that the Department of Health must assist provincial departments in strengthening financial management planning and internal controls to improve and maintain audit outcomes. Challenges of patient neglect, equipment, failure, organizational chaos, and staff work overload will persist, and South Africans will continue to pay the brand in financial management is not sufficiently addressed. With, uh, notwithstanding the concerns raised, the IFP accepts the report. Thank you very much, honorable member. FF plus. Geachte voorzitter, aan hierdie departement is daar geen salf meer te smeer nie. Want administratie en corruptie is bezig om op een dagelijkse basis hierdie departement op sy knieën te doen en ons sien dit uitspeel in ons openbare hospitaal en klinieke. Vir die 22-23 boekjaar het onreelmatige uitgaves vir die gezondheidssector te staan gekom op een skrikwekkende 7 miljard rand. Die departement het een onderbesteding aangetoon van 2 miljard rand. Meriese rechtseise vir hierdie boekjaar het een staand gekom op 67 miljard rand. In die achterstand in meriese procedures is nog nie opgelost nie. Daar is ook geen verbetering in termen van ouduitkomste vir vier achter in volgende jare nie. En die groot sondebokke hier is die Oostkaap, die Vrijstaat en die Noordkaap. Material misstatements were identified for Gauteng, Mapumalanga and North West. Critical positions that are not filled with the right skills is alarming. Another concern is the lack of internal controls and the lack of oversight. But welkom erwekkend is, voorzitter, is dat die Mapumalanga provincie fictieve gefabriceerde uitbetalings gedoen het vanuit al onderhuisbegroting vir infrastructuur en instandhouding. Die vrystaat het betalings nie binnen 30 dag gemaakt nie, en dat was betalings gemaakt vir werk wat nie gelever was nie. Die oostkap het faktere nie binnen 30 dag betaal nie, en noordwest het prijse vir meerese toerusting betaal wat nie markverwant is nie. The provinces together with the relevant MECs must come and account before the portfolio committee of on health, they must start to take responsibility for the mess the provinces are currently in, and they must be, they must be consequences due to this. Voorzitter, daar is een oplossing vir hierdie probleme wat tans hierdie departement en hierdie gezondheidssector dagelijks in die gezicht staar en waar patiënten nie die behandeling in hospitale klinieke krij wat hulle verdien nie. Daar is een oplossing en voor die oplossing is eenvoudig. The solution is to defeat the ANC during next year's election and to elect a government that is accountable and what is responsible. This is the solution for South Africa. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The ACDP. Honorable Chairperson, 
the mandate of parliament is not to be the praise singers of departments, but to fulfill our constitutional obligation of oversight. And it seems that we forget that. We forget the indictment of the Zondo report because many of our members think that we need to flatter the department. That is not our role. The ACDP has committed itself through its public office bearers to address dysfunction and poor performance in governance because of the devastating effect on the people of this country. The ACDP requested a report on the utilization of the 7.4, 7.6 billion loan from the World Bank made for procurement of vaccinations in 2022. This report was never provided. The ACDP requested that the committee receive a briefing on the no-fault compensation fund. No such a briefing was given in spite of two letters. Yet COVID had a devastating effect on our health services and contributed to increase in government debt. It would be a failure for us not to be provided with a comprehensive report on the expenditure on COVID vaccinations, especially in light of the loan. The expenditure of the Department of Health does not translate into better services on the ground. It means the money we spend does not change the lives of the people that need the health services. The idea that the NHI will be the silver bullet for our challenges ignores the capacity of the incapable state. We have a leadership and governance deficit that the NHI simply will not rectify. And it is time for this government to acknowledge that, that it cannot provide the essential services that our people need. It cannot. It is incapable to do that. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The UDM. A ATM. Good. NFP. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. The National Freedom Party will support the report tabled here today. We have taken note of the Financial and Fiscal Commission and particularly the Auditor General of South Africa's findings and particularly on the National Department of Health and SEPRA. The NFP have repeatedly called for a preventative healthcare system in this country. And now that we can see it is more needed than before because we have people who've got a hearing problem and they've got a sight problem in this very house. Given the fact that so many ambulances and hospitals were bombed in Gaza and they could not see that, so perhaps they need more attention than others. But having said that, our concern is that there's going to be a budget cut. And having a budget cut means it's going to impact on the health sector. Our serious concern, however, Chairperson, is that, and, and, and this is the question I want to ask, why do we need to wait for somebody to die before we act? We've repeatedly raised the concerns of food products manufactured in South Africa, and there's no oversight mechanisms. To the extent that our people are dying at a very young age, number one, and that is why the previous Minister of Health emphasized on a preventative healthcare system like you have in Cuba. And I think it is time that we looked at that very seriously so that our people don't have to get sick and die, okay? I think that is very, very important. And, and, and my concern is on the implementation of the NHI with such a large budget cut. Is it going to be able to be implementable timelessly and be effective? So as the National Freedom Party, we also want to call on government at some stage to consider moving away from the World Health Organization and we need to create a new World Health Organization. If you look at the reports of the effects of the vaccines that we have taken and the number of people that are dying from cardiac arrest and strokes. I agree with, 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 with President Putin. We need a new World Health Organization. A Thank new you, World Monetary Honorable Fund. The NFP will support Thank it. Thank you, ma'am. AIC. Cope. PAC. No, 
Good declaration, sir. Thank you. Hello, Jamal. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable House Chair. Honorable House Chair, the DA wants fiscal disability. That's a new word for this parliament. So that means you die if you're poor and you live if you have money. The apartheid self, but the freedom front plus prat fund also means that blacks should not live. So there's less people that will vote for the parties of the liberation movement. A vote for the DA is a vote for blacks to die because they cannot afford medical costs and shouldn't get medical treatment. Every year, universal health is delayed, puts us back 10 years. Our party has put us back for more than a century, so a solution as proposed by parliament, the people's parliament, is the way forward. The NHI is the answer. Bite the bullet to save lives. Thank you very much, Honorable House Chair. Thank you, Honorable Member. The ANC. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson and uh, Dixoni Pile, Chief Whip. Abanye Bafike Bakami Seba Chale Apakota Gu Portfolio Kabis Kok Abeba Tu Labanga was no ten. Uh, the African National Congress supports the Portfolio Committee on Health Budget uh, Review and Recommendation Report. We welcome and applaud the Department of Health's improved audit outcomes from qualified opinion to unqualified findings. We are encouraged by the Department's HIV and AIDS response uh, for achieving 94, 76, 92 targets against the 95, 95 targets. Chairperson, the committee's report provides a number of crucial recommendations, including emphasizes on the significance of strengthening accountability and consequence management mechanism in order to promote transparency as well as a good and ethical governance. The report gives recommendation on strengthening the department's systems to ensure a better budget expenditure and infrastructure development. As the ANC, we believe the recommendations in the report are vital and enhancing system and processes for Im implementation of NHI, which will be a key milestone for our country's growth and positioning healthcare as a human right and not as a privilege based on people's economic standing. The ANC support the report is rooted, is rooted in expiration of improving the quality of health services, transforming a uh, country's uh, divisive uh, two-tier health system, addressing systematic and uh, structural imbalances, and for forging a future towards universal health coverage. As the ANC, we are committed to the report's recommendation geared towards a system in which every rent is tailed and all the department's programs are evaluated for their impact on improving the health outcomes of all our people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. I put the motion again. Are there any objections? No objections agreed to. The secretary will read the last order of the day. Consideration of budgetary review and recommendation report of portfolio committee on social development. And I'll recognize the honorable the chief whip of the majority party. Thank you. Requests for declarations of vote have been received. I will now allow for up to two minutes one member of each political party wishing to make a declaration and opportunity to do so. The DA. Thank you, Honorable Chair. It was, it was reported to the committee that the Department of Social Development and the NDA had obtained clean audits. The whole portfolio showed an improved performance as far as its audit findings are concerned. We congratulate the department for its efforts in this regard. But at the same meeting, 
we had to express our grave concerns about repeat audit findings of inadequate oversight by DSD over SASA, slow response of management to address weaknesses, payment of social grants to ineligible beneficiaries and invalid lease contracts, to mention but a few. And to add, add insults to the injury, the department returned over 6 billion rand to Treasury. 6 billion rand while South Africa is reeling from a shortage of social workers. We are a mere six years from the NDP deadline of 2030, which recognizes the critical need for social welfare services, particularly in the areas of gender-based violence, crime, child protection, violence prevention, substance abuse, trauma counseling, mental health, and care for the elderly. At this rate, it is absolutely impossible that the target of 55,000 social services practitioners by 2030 will be achieved. The DA, however, will be keeping a close eye on the implementation of the department's strategy at an estimated cost of 9 billion rand. At the rate and pace of absorption of unemployed social workers into the system, this is just another ANC pipe dream and lip service to which the most vulnerable in this country have become accustomed. That is until 2024, when the DA will implement a decent social development policy. I thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Member. EFF. Thank you, Chair. Chairperson, the EFF rejects this report. In a country where we have so many social ills, it is inconceivable that a department tasked with the mandate that it is tasked with can fail to employ the very same social workers that it has paid for their scholarships. Chairperson, the country is in dire need of social workers and we have thousands of social workers currently unemployed across the country because of this department. Not only that, there is no staff stability in the department. The department is run by acting senior managers. I think it is a Hollywood setup there. Uh, there is no plan to appoint managers on permanent basis anytime soon. SRD grant is a total mess because people who apply are never given feedback. There is a serious audit that must be done to determine where these monies go to, because in most cases, the money never reaches the people it is intended for. Not even the department is able to swiftly act to inter interimly help elderly people, like those who were recently paid with fake notes by pick and pay in Ivory Park. Had it not been the Good Samaritans of EFF chair, the elderly people would have gone without food for the month because they haven't resolved that matter. The department keeps rejecting applications, <coughs> sorry, from NPOs that are rendering crucial services simply on the basis of some vague criteria that department uses. The most ridiculous of this department's failure is that relating to SASA and administration of grants. SASA is constantly failing our elderly people and all other grant recipients with their failure to upgrade their systems, leaving thousands of beneficiaries stranded each month. The department is also not friendly towards disabled people. People who would otherwise qualify for disability grants Thank you very much. must wait for Honorable months member. before they are admitted. Thank you, Chair. We reject, we reject the report, Chair. The IFP. Thank you very much, Honorable House Chairperson. House Chairperson, at a time when South Africa faces deep and severe social challenges, Prince Butelezi's legacy, which we remember today, was one of service to the poor and marginalized. History records that the schools, the hospitals, the homes, the universities that were built in KwaZulu Natal were due to his leadership. He remained deeply rooted in the service to his people. His example of servant leadership saw life-changing opportunities for many disadvantaged South Africans. Turning to this BRRR report, it is unfortunate to note that not much has changed since last year. 
vacancies remain, fraud and corruption at SASA remains, SASA still pays people who are not eligible to receive the grant. The grant chaos which recently saw millions of beneficiaries, especially the elderly, go without food for almost a month, speaks to a system that is struggling and on the verge of collapse. But Honorable Chairperson, let me point out further gaps. This department has made little to no progress in the fight against gender-based violence or in protecting the rights of children or in protecting the rights of the elderly. DSD has failed to make any progress in employing the thousands of trained social workers who are sitting at home. And let me remind you, we need these social workers to protect children at schools, to fight substance abuse in our communities, and to protect the children on the gangs that are in Cape Flats and in Wentworth. As the IFP stands ready to govern in KwaZulu-Natal in 2024, we, as a government in KZN, will support NPOs who are facing closure because the Department of Social Development in KwaZulu-Natal are paying them late, thereby forcing them to close their doors, thereby failing the most vulnerable who rely on their services. We, as the IFP, will rise to protect abandoned babies by legalizing baby savers. We will protect our children. We will protect those living with disabilities. And we will lead the fight against gender-based violence. Simply put, an IFP and government will do what the ANC is not doing, prioritizing the marginalized and poor, just like Prince Putalezi did. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Um, F, F plus. Thank you, House Chair. This department and its entities have more than half of South Africans reliant on them in some form or another, yet challenges continue to persist. The challenges being faced by DSD and SASA are so great that one almost forgets the NDA is also an entity of this department. There are but a number of positives that vaguely improve the standing of this department, like the improved audit outcome. But when it comes to boots on the ground service delivery, the same cannot be said. There is still a number of critical vacancies in this department. We have seen an acting DG in this department for many years now, and every year it is in the AGSA's report. There are many committee observations that are quite worrying. worrying. Struggles with NPO funding and appeals is one such challenge, and the continuing service delivery woes that is still hampering SASA is another. The move from SAPU to Postbank was marred by issues that started even before the ink on the new agreement between SASA and the Postbank had time to dry. We have now had a number of network challenges, discontinuations of systems, system glitches, and other oopsie-daisies that have seen SASA beneficiaries not receiving their payments. What is further worrying is the whole postbank debacle is that not once was sufficient communication given to anyone. Telephone lines that eventually started working could not take the number of calls and then also crashed, leaving beneficiaries without answers. Many of us as members were also contacted by these beneficiaries who had exhausted all avenues and we could also not assist because we also did not have the answers. The Postbank is now making promises that the issues are sorted, but I'm not holding my breath. The only question that begs to be asked is how will our most vulnerable suffer? How long will they suffer before this government starts acting and addressing problems in a proactive manner instead of having it fall apart first and then being reactive? South Africans deserve better. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Uh, ACDP. Honorable Chairperson, the ACDP rises in this budget debate in solidarity with ordinary South Africans who are facing the no no normal daily crises of poverty, a crisis that is not improving but getting worse as our state appears incapable of driving the necessary societal and economic change that will make the work of the DSD less rather than more important. This daily or ordinary crisis is however dwarfed by what befalls our vulnerable communities when an extraordinary crisis strikes them. 
communities that I represent, both in the Western and Northern Cape, have recently been struck by floods. And on both occasions, we saw the disaster of poverty being turned into a community devastating event. The vulnerable became sick, key family members died, and whole families now face devastating circumstances as a result. As I speak to you, my community is still living in a hall in the Western Cape. In every branch of the state, we must put the family first, and stop undermining the family. In every committee I serve on health, education, and even social development, the state is undermining the family. We can never have enough money. Excuse me, member. Uh, ICT, I, could you please? Honorable Mary Peterson. Could you please remove? I'm Sorry about that, honorable member, if may continue. We can never have enough money to replace the role of the family, and we must make the rebuilding of the family a national priority. The second strong foundation that we need to build on is community. The community is closest to problems, and we must allow empower the community to solve them themselves. The real measure of success of the DSD is not how many of our people it helps, but how many people it impacts who no longer needs its services. And in this, we are failing dismally. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. UDM, ATM, good, NFP. Thank you, House Chairperson. The National Freedom Party will support the report tabled here. But above that, we'd like to congratulate the department on getting an unqualified audit opinion, which is an improvement from the previous one. But whilst we talk about women and children, particularly and the conditions under which they live, let us not forget the plight of the women and the children in Gaza and other parts of Palestine many of whom are dying of hunger and thirst because of the atrocities committed by the apartheid Zionist state of Israel. To such an extent, with their checkpoints, they will not allow access to water, food, and these are major concerns that they face. But having said that, I also want to say this, that I hear some comments, negative comments about the Department of Social Development. Is it not the responsibility of each and every one of us to apply our minds to what is happening on the ground? And why I'm going to this chief open chairperson is this. We passed a bill recently on the basic education bill. And one of it is that children must be at school. In full view of us right here in the city of Cape Town, I can take you right now. Tomorrow I can take you again during school hours, hundreds of them are standing all over the street corners, all over not at school. So you pass the bill, but you ignore it and do nothing about it. You don't do anything about it because you don't care about those children. You don't care about those children because they're not your class. This is basically what it is. Why don't you get off your backsides and go there and make sure that those children are in school? That is the least you can actually do. So don't come here and say you care and you'll do this because you don't care. Right in front of here, right by the intersection when you come out of that house that you, the taxpayers are paying for, go and have a look and see exactly what is happening. But you will not do it, but you'll come here and you'll criticize the other thing. So Thank do you that. Very go much, and your Honorable the NFC Shaykh support Imam. this report table. Yet. AIC. Hope. EAC. No declaration, Chair. Thank you very much. Al Jama. Honorable Al Chair, I hope you're not going to feel sorry for me. I am married to a social worker for 50 years. And order, I know that honorable members. if that was not the case, I would have been a delinquent. So we support the report. 
we have a minister of social welfare who was a fighter. I hear we have fighters today. They were nowhere near the fighters we had in the days of the liberation struggle. So our minister, she fought for our freedom, and now she's fighting for the poor and vulnerable. Al Jama supports the report. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. ANC. Thank you very much, uh, House Chair. Greetings to honorable members, Gakumbi Chief Whip. Uh, you know, I am very happy when I hear other organizations and other honorable members are witnessing that we have fought for this country as social development. Yes, there are challenges and hiccups somewhere there. But we are correcting each and everything that we've done wrong. Chaperson, the African National Congress has long envisaged a South Africa where social justice reigns supreme. Poverty is broken and each individual dignity is respected. It is therefore against the background of the ANC supports the budget uh, of the Portfolio Committee on Social Development. It is really surprising for those ones that are also sitting in the committee and today they are just rejecting the budget. Yeah, they, we are encouraged by the department's clean audit outcome, that's number one, and its effort in implementing the findings of the AG. We also commend the consequences management measures being undertaken by the department through disciplinary actions against officials who are implicated in unethical uh, conduct, which compromises the efforts of the department. These positive actions affirm the department's commitment towards social transformation and re realizing the goals uh, outlined in the National Development Plan and Medium Term Strategic Framework. Chairperson, as the ANC, we support the committee. Committee's report because it outlines a number of recommendations, such as proposal of, on mechanism of improving the social protection through more effective measures to administer social grants. These interventions Thank are you very much, for the member. development of basic income time is up. that you know it's pipeline, it's on pipeline. Thank you. you. I thank you. Order, order, honorable Sengwa. I put the motion again. Are there any objections? No objections, honorable. Uh, as as EFF, we object. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Noted. With, the, with that objection, the report is agreed to. Order, honorable members. I request members to stand and wait for the chair and the mains to leave the chamber. That concludes the business for the day and the house is urgent.